Oh, shalom, my friends. Shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder, spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. Oh, don't squeeze the curl too, too hard. It'll hurt. There we go. Wait, what did you do here? What, what the hell is that? Doesn't matter with you. That's better. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here on this Shabbos morning in October. Wait, here we go. <laughs> Oh, yeah, she is cute. Let's, 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 uh, here, let's do that. Anywho, with us in the neighborhood is a lovely Jewess. Her name is Melanie Greenberg. By the way, you have to, you're going to have to, oh, you did unmute. You're fantastic. Melanie, let me tell you a little about Melanie Greenberg and her show, her one woman show that she will be doing at the United Solo Theater Festival in New York. For three nights, one is already sold out. You can't even get tickets for it, but the other two you can go to. It's called The Elephant in the Room. It's about a nice Jewish girl. You had me with Jewish. <laughs> and her psychedelic odyssey, this is her words, that goes from Yale to alcoholism. That sounds like a natural progression to me, actually. Pentecostal churches and mental illness. Those also go together. She is a comedian and actress. Her motto is... When life gives you lemons, make comedy. I say when life gives you lemons, trade them for etrogs, but that's just me. Ladies and gentlemen, won't you please <laughs> welcome to the neighborhood, Melanie Greenberg. Shalom, Melanie. Shalom. Good Shabbos to you. Good Shabbos to you, too. So you know the lingo. How, so I know the lingo. <gasps> despite the church stuff. How Jewy were you growing up? Were, were you middle class, uh, conservative, not not at all? Like? I was I was like a I was like you know a break the Yom Kippur fast with a bagel and a schmear kind of a Jew. You know, um, I I actually I have kids myself, and my what I am sort of insisting on in our own household is that they each do a minimum of a year in Hebrew school because yes. for me. Right, because I feel like I'm not particularly religious, but the experience I had growing up was that I always felt very comfortable in a synagogue. And now I go to synagogue and I hear the music. I go, I'm mostly I'm a high holiday kind of a Jew and I feel at home. So that's the kind of Jew I am, where it's like synagogue feels like home. I have self-deprecating humor and I eat bagels. You can, please come to my shul. The music on, on the high holidays, everybody was kung fu fighting. We all sing along with that. We love it. It's fantastic. Boogie Yogi Yogi we sing. Uh, we do some Wagner too, just to piss some people off. But it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. What is your Hebrew name? Do you know? Oh, God, I don't know my Hebrew name. So I guess that tells you a little something okay. about... Wait, so but, were you bought did you just, did you, did you, I was bought mitzvah. <laughs> What was it? Do you have any memories of your bat mitzvah? Um, I wore a terrible pink lace dress. So did I! Amazing! <laughs> it was the early 90s. I didn't know any better. Um, gosh, I remember, well, I mean, it's funny and it fits with it. But, you know, I, in my era of bat mitzvahing in LA where I grew up, it was like you had a theme. Your party had like a big theme. And then you'd do every table would be decorated according to the theme. And my theme being the big theater dork that I was and still am was Broadway musicals. So every table was like the Phantom of the Opera table or the Les Miserables table. And that was so yes. that, that probably tells you everything you need to know about me growing at, up. At my, uh, my bar mitzvah, we had an end game table. Where we just had people in garbage cans singing there. It was, it was wonderful. I loved it. Ah. <laughs> now, what's interesting, though, is that it sounds like, you know, yeah, you lived in L.A., you had a nice bat mitzvah, you had a nice Jewish upbringing, um, seems pretty comfortably middle-class Jewess, and yet mm -hmm. you ran away from home when you were 15 or something like that? Did you have a bad what? What the hell happened that, that suddenly led you on a weird life path? I mean, it's interesting, and and that's part of what my show tries to untangle is, in many ways, my own confusion about my own narrative because there was nothing about this L.A. you know Broadway musical bat mitzvah that would have indicated, as you said, the path that I would go on. And you know, I think for one thing, I part of it, you know, there's nature and there's nurture. I think I just kind of came into the world with with existential angst, you know, from as Hello, you're Jewish. 
Hello. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I think part of it was this feeling of what is all of this and why am I here? And this sort of like unease about the fact that I didn't know. Um, you know, I think part of it was sort of a hyper exaggerated mythological thing that happens between, you know, a daughter and her mother and this sort of like need for separation, um, which, you know, I think mother, look, mother, I was going to say mother daughter relationships are fraught, but so are father son relationships. And I mean, it's all just, you know, we come into the world and we develop these relationships and then we spend the rest of our lives trying to untangle them in therapy. So I loved my parents and my parents were wonderful parents, but we, you know, I felt this very intense need. I, I felt misunderstood. I felt I didn't know what was going on and I wasn't getting answers in my environment. I felt sort of a mismatch with the environment where I was living, you know, first in on the west side of LA and then the Upper East Side of uh, New York. And I felt like I, I needed separation. Yeah, but um, you couldn't have held out to, you were like, first year of college when kids get that separation anyway and they move away. I mean, that's just what they do. Because you know, when did you break? How old were you? I was 15 when I ran away from home. Yeah. You know, it was, I was, you know, it's probably hard to imagine after hearing the tale about my Broadway musical bat mitzvah, but I wasn't a kid who particularly fit in that well. Um, Hello, and, you're Jewish! <laughs> I'm Jewish and I love Broadway musicals. This was not the recipe for a happy adolescence. So I... I was just so miserably unhappy in my own skin and in my environment. And, you know, like I said, I was living in a household where I felt as I think many adolescents do misunderstood. And I spent a summer in Colorado where I met like this group of friends, you know, as all good. Do I hear the do. word they cult? Take their, uh, uh, there, was, there was no, I, there is a cult in my story, but that comes later. Um, and I was just like, this is my home. These are my people. I feel understood. And for like a kid who spent most of her childhood and life feeling disconnected and misunderstood, like that felt so urgent to me, you know, it felt, and I was 15. I didn't have a great, you know, I talk a lot about like kind of the adolescent mind. It's not a mind that's thinking long-term. It's not a mind that's three years from 15 in college that felt interminable. Are you kidding me? You know? Um, and I had no idea at that time, I think, of the consequences of my actions and also, of, you know, the impact it was going to have on the people around me. Now, by the way, I want to remind people what you're leading into is the story that you tell in your one woman show. It's called The Elephant in the Room, because so far it sounds OK. It sounds like, OK, you left home, you're 15, but you found a good group of friends who were nice and they protected you and you were OK. Were you working? I mean, what the hell? How did it, well, I did. I never made it there is the thing. I had gone there over the summer with my with my parents and I ran away because I needed to be with these people. They were my people. And um, and I never made it there. I went on sort of this wild journey that landed me in Texas. And that's where that's where I met the born agains. Um, it was actually a very lovely family. I mean, I got extreme, I was extremely lucky. I met this woman on the train from New Orleans to Texas and she had me come stay with her family and they took me to church and I was a spiritual seeker and I saw people speaking in tongues. I saw people shouting. I saw people, I mean, my whole life, I was just looking for certainty for someone who seemed to know what it was all about. And these people, I was like, they get it. They're, they have, they feel. Uh, uh, if you want to come see people shout, just come to my place for dinner on a Thursday night. <laughs> I'm shouting. My wife is shouting. The children are shouting. You get it. You get more shouting than you need for ten years. I could have saved myself a lot of trouble if I'd just gone to your house. Please of explain Houston. to me though. It's this, this thing of I don't I don't know how this happens of of going to just walking into a building, normal quote unquote people for a, a religious service of some sort. And then they, they, I mean, are they faking it? Are they mentally, how do you suddenly start rolling around going, gibble gabba gubba labba gubba luka baba? You know, how is that, is it real? Or are they making believe that they're doing this, that so they fit into the Pentecostal thing and they show off a little? Was it real? I don't, I mean, it's such an, it's funny. I actually just asked this, I just, I recently saw the Tammy Faye movie. I don't know if you, if you saw it. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a scene early on where she walks into Pentecostal church and she starts speaking in tongues. And I remember um, I turned to my friend and I said, what is that? Is that some kind of like, is it like a group delusion? I mean, I mean, I think people in that moment must feel they're channeling something to the point where they're convincing there's I, I yeah I don't think people are intentionally fake I mean maybe some are but, but I think really, people I, are really how that happens I mean, uh, by the way uh, there's someone obviously in your place who, who's uh, speaking in dog tongue right now uh, yes exactly uh, yes <laughs> I I have I have many of them they're part of a group delusion so, themselves the messed up thing is that's a cat so I've got to tell <laughs> just kidding so so all right so you were you falling again as you're saying a lucky way because they're a nice family they're good people and you did but you never i mean you wanted to believe you tried to believe but you never rolled around spoken tongues or or had like you know, feel like you felt a spirit or, or or jesus or god or allah or sherman helmsley went through you no, I didn't feel it. But I, what I felt was their certainty and they actually arranged. It never happened because I ended up going home. They arranged for my baptism while I was living with them. And I thought this is great. I'm going to get baptized and then I'll be speaking into because I, I wanted that. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for that conviction. I mean, I walked into you could have at age 15 walked into that church and looked around and been like, this is insane. But I was like, this is amazing. These people are connecting with something and I want to connect with that, you know. So why, um, why did you uh, go home before you were, thank God, baptized? <laughs> Thank God. Um, uh, from Bob it, once you baptism. get that water on, you got shit. Don't watch off. Watch off. I've never <laughs> given Bob Dylan for that. It's just like, oh, what? You, <laughs> Billy Graham's pool. You have to do that. The most famous <laughs> Jewish songwriter in the world, and you got to do that, you asshole. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, what happened was, uh, you know, like a nice Jewish girl. It was Jewish guilt. I I called a friend of mine to check in, and she told me that my parents were understandably distraught and I felt really badly and so I decided to go home oh All it right. was like so that, that just... adolescent moment of like oh I am not a per you know you're sort of a narcissist at that age you all you especially if you're unhappy all you are all you can see or feel or experience is your own pain and then suddenly I was reminded that hello like, we're Jewish okay we are yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that your husband laughing in the back? Because I hear somebody laughing there besides the dog. Is there somebody? You want? No, I have no husband. Is it? Oh. Is it my own laughter? Maybe I was the echoing reverberations of your giggling and the dog too. It's, it's, it's kind of it's both. I have a very dog. robust laugh. Yes, yes, indeed you do. I'm uh, forgive me for. for um, Hello, I'm Jewish. <laughs> Catching on, right? <laughs> So here's the deal, but at that point, it's kind of a pretty normal story. So you ran away, you came back. But even then, you had a much more weird life to come, as opposed to just, oh, I'm back home. I've gone through this stage I went through, and now I'll go to college. I'll, I'll, I'll meet somebody. I'll live with somebody for a while. I'll get a job, and boom. No, with you, more crap. Well, I think that's what I thought would happen. Um, I think I thought I'd come home and everyone would be like, well, that was crazy. But, um, and then my life would go on. And, but that's not how it ended. I mean, I ended up setting off a chain of events by making that choice to run away that would impact the rest of my life. I came home and um, my parents were worried about my mental health because I had run away from home and they're Jewish. And um, I was hospitalized oh, okay. um, because I, I think the concern was that I was bipolar and that I'd done something really sort of insane and off the rails and that I needed help. And that hospital, I mean, what ends, what can happen often is that, and this is not me, you know, there are places that exist that help people with mental health issues that are wonderful, but what can happen is that once you kind of get into the system of institutions, you just stay in that system because one diagnosis leads to another. And you also sort of start to act out the diagnoses you've been given. Okay. Yeah, Shul works the same way. You take a normal person and then they, they turn into me. And it's then and then suddenly, yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow. So you've lived that life. Now, how, it's, it's interesting, though. How long 
have you lived what most people would now consider a normal, you know, kids, a nice little place, you're doing theater, you know, you know, how long have you lived, quote unquote, normally? I mean, it's interesting. And I mean, I think this is really what I am. I don't really know that. I don't even know what normally is. And, and I don't know if anyone's really living normally. Um, I, I mean, I've had kids for as long as I've had kids, which is 11 years, but it was in the past few years. Oh, thank you. It was in the past few. Do you have kids? Oh my God. I have 21 and a half children and they all hate me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Uh, um, Wait, did you yeah. have? I mean, you say eleven years. You had twins then? Maybe. No, I well, eleven is the is my el, is my oh. eldest. Yes, my but um, you know, I don't think it's interesting in writing the show. I really learned that these events of my earlier life ended up impacting the rest of my life. I don't know that I ever did really live in a normal adulthood. Um, Even now, I mean, would you say what you live now is? You know, a, a typical. You go to Starbucks. You 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 look at what they charge for a coffee, and you're like, God damn it, you're paying anyway. No. I mean, is that your life now, or is it still? I'd say. I mean, I'd say. Look, and I think this is part of. You know, you ask this question of why I ran away. I think I've always been by nature a little bit unconventional, which is why some of the environments that I lived in never really felt like a fit for me. So I don't know that I am or ever will be living a completely normal adult life. Um, I think I'm becoming sort of more com comfortable with my own right. reality as a normal person or abnormal person, or I think maybe just more aware that everyone else is less normal than they maybe think they are. There you go. I, li I like that explanation. So what gave you the impetus to look back on your, not just to look back on your life, because anybody in therapy is going to be doing that every week, but right. write it down and turn it into theater. Well, I think that's what it, it was a few years ago. I went like sort of on a real journey to figure out just to sort of make sense of my life. I mean, you know, like I've been in therapy my whole life. I talk about how in my household therapy was almost its own religion growing up. Um, and, but I just decided that like there were things in my life that weren't working and ways in which I didn't actually feel like I was settling into the kind of adulthood I wanted to have. And I wanted to make sense of that. So I sort of did a deep dive into my life and making sense of that. And part of that was writing my story and in a way rewriting and reclaiming my own narrative. Because I think the narrative I always had around myself was that there was something wrong with me. And so I did this crazy thing and then I kept getting diagnosis after diagnosis. And I think um, part of writing my story was rewriting that narrative just for myself. And, and the choice though, also not to make it a, a monograph or a short story, or a nonfiction short story, but to, to, I want to perform this as a performative performance thing with performing. When, you know, when did that kick in? Well, that was also part of the whole process because part of what I think I realized, you know, in this journey of self-discovery, we're going to, you know, find a really corny way to say it, was that I abandoned at some point in my life during all this, my one true love, which was theater and performance. And, you know, because I had the, you know, a kid who has a Phantom of the Opera table at her bat mitzvah, that kid has a dream of yeah. being on a Broadway stage one day. And at some point during the midst of all of this, you know, this hospitalization and this diagnosing and, you know, sort of the trauma that that created. And then the aftermath of that trauma, which was alcohol and drug abuse, I lost all of that. Um, and so it became very obvious to me as I began this journey that what have I always wanted? It's to be on a stage, you know, I have to um, ask, what, what was your drug of choice? Because alcohol is, you know, anybody can get, they can go on a thing, but right. and, and when you say drug abuse, you don't think marijuana. What the hell were you on? Yeah, well, it was a period of my life where I was on pretty much anything I could get my hands on. It was an, And it was a short period, which I now, you know, have sort of come to recognize as a reaction to trauma rather than... Um, rather than actual addiction, but you know, I did cocaine, I did said what I was, I was just really trying not to be in my own body in whatever way I could. Did any of them work? Did any of them, you know, they, they're terrible for you and they'll kill you eventually, but were any of them like, you know, this was actually pretty good and I hate giving this one up? Um, 
I mean, I think it was all of it. I think I, uh, it was the combination of, you know, I have a line in my show. Um, I, I say, I, I talk about how I, well, one time in, in rehab, I smoked crack and I did heroin. And then, you know, the, the line is, the irony is that I had never done that before, nor have I since, you know, and speaking from this limited personal experience, neither the crack nor the opiate epidemics are a huge mystery to me. I mean, these, these substances make you feel good for the moment that they're, you, you know, that's why these epidemics exist. So it was hard, I think, to, to let go of them all. That's how I feel about herring and cream sauce. <laughs> I know it's going to give me gas. I know it's going to give me a little heartburn and think, but oh, when I first opened the jar and I plugged, oh my God, and, and there it is. You know, you can't resist. But that's sort of the human condition, right? It's like this, you know, these things that like what makes us feel good in the moment isn't always what's going to make us feel good with a capital G, you know, in the long term and sort of weighing that all the time. And it could be, it could be herring and cream sauce. It could be binge watching a TV show till three in the morning, or it could be, you know, an opiate. Or reading Torah. Let's not forget that one. Or reading Torah. Yes. Yeah. The, 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 the seedy underbelly of reading too much Torah. So now you have a one person show and you're going to be yes. doing that. Can I call you, by the way, a woman? Can I call it a one woman show? Yes. And so what? Yes. Like I have to call it. It's a one thing. Show. It's a one it show. No, it's a one woman show. It's a one woman. You put it together. How long was the first draft? I'm always wondering about this. Was it like? Well, it's, I mean, long? it's so much longer. I mean, because you know, it's interesting because I had to really boil down my show to. <laughs> I have one of those in my house. My daughter just got one at her first week of Hebrew school. You know what my daughter said about Hebrew school? She keeps going. She goes, every week I, uh, well, oh yeah. So I, she didn't want to go the other day. And I said, you've loved it the last couple of times. She said, that's because every time I've gone so far, they give you something. I think they just bribe us to keep us there. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's eight and she gets it already. Um, so, but, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. So, but you were saying, what, what the hell is my question? Um, oh, right. So how long was the show? Well, it's interesting because, so I was in, I was in this, you know, in this hospital scenario. And then after the hospital, I got sent to this, we, we talked about the cult thing, this really crazy school that was actually a spinoff of a cult. It was for bad kids. It's been shut down. There were lawsuits. And in both of these environments there were so many kind of like interesting stories that didn't feed my overall narrative but were just interesting you know and there's an expression in writing i'm not sure i assume you're familiar with it it's killing your babies uh -huh. like i'd have this story that was just hilarious but wasn't driving my bigger narrative forward but it was so hard to get rid of them because it was either interesting in sort of a freakish way or it was funny do me a favor do me tell me a story that couldn't make you for time and for for a narrative structure that was in there but that you took out that you still love tell me a story that would have been in the show if there was room well one of the i guess one of the things i talk about is how at the school that i went to one of the weird things about it for me right when i got there was that everywhere you looked people were cuddling with each other um which is yes it's C cuddling bit. clothed in a not in a, but in a, you know, or cuddling. Well, I mean, it was, I mean, it was all very weird. Like everyone was clothed and it wasn't supposed to be sexual, but, and there were, but adults were doing it with, with students, which is obviously yeah. everything you think it is. And it, there were just, and there were, it was weird. There were piles of it. I know we need the Torah to defend us again. <laughs> I mean, stop basically it, it. everywhere you looked and then sometimes there'd be someone crying in the middle of the circle. It was like, I think, you know, it was sort of, um, like I said, it was a spinoff of a cult that was sort of a, but it was really odd. You know, you'd find there were like 10 kids and they'd all just be like kind of lying on top of each other in these cuddle piles. And then there'd be an adult um, kind of thrown into the mix and everyone stroking each other's hair and cuddling. It was a very weird. So that was like interesting in a really freakish way and everyone thought it was fascinating, but it well, didn't let me, let me ask a larger you, let, narrative. Let, 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 as you said, eventually they closed this place, they stopped it. They were, did you ever notice from that 
that it wouldn't stop it. I mean, did, did you ever see anything where it was underage, whatever, or non-consensual? Or really, was it just weird because we're uptight American Jewish people and a bunch of people hugging each other feels weird, but they didn't really do anything wrong? Well, I think what what you know, retrospectively, so much of what happened at this school, because a lot of like the therapeutic practices they used were are part of therapeutic practices that I've encountered as I've gotten older and that people, but it was the lack of consent. It was it wasn't like cuddling was optional. It was sort of like, this is what we're doing here, get with the program. And so it's like, you know, I should have had the right to say no because I was an uptight Jewish kid at age 15 for even if it was only because I was uptight, you know, like right, right. to be right. forced into a situation. And frankly, at the end of the day, like there should never be a scenario where adults are cuddling with children. And there was also, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There was sexual abuse at the school. Yeah. It was I know that there's a synagogue run by a rabbi. I know that that, that is fisting days. And I'm just like, no, that they should not be. <laughs> Apparently, there's a form that you can fill out where you can opt out, oh, but only on the the rest of the time. I mean, that's there. There has to be the opt out form, you know. Right. That's, that's sort of my feeling about everything, you know. It's uh, do what you want, but as long as everyone's on board and it's not harmful to anyone. Now, I ask Puddles. this question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I ask sorry. This question, people who do this, these autobiographical kinds of shows mm -hmm. and things and, mono, and, and monologues and so. So, in doing it. In, in finally writing this all down and now in editing it and tweaking it and making it artistic and performing it, is there catharsis or is there just, no, it's always going to be there. The trauma will always be there. Now I've just happened to have written it. Oh, it was, it was, it was extremely cathartic and actually to the, so much so that I'm very interested in, I'm trying to, set up like a nonprofit where I've done nonprofit work in the past with organizations that do healing work around, you know, healing trauma with storytelling. And, you know, that was very compelling to me in and of itself and part of the impetus for writing my own story. Um, but I really believe in this. I really believe that like writing and re-understanding and then sharing your story at either an individual level or a collective level is extremely healing and extremely cathartic. All right, let me ask, have you performed the show anywhere? Have you workshopped it? Have you done it for friends, readings? How, how or, or are you just gonna- I did a workshop of it up yeah. here. I, so I'm living in the Berkshires now. Um, what, do you, wait, wait, yeah. what do you do for a living? If you're making theater like this, you're, you're, you look like you're living rather nicely. If you don't mind my asking, do you have a day job? I don't. I mean, I have in the past. I don't right now. God bless. Um, yeah. Yeah. God, God bless. Right. Right now. I'm just, um, yeah, I've, I'm fortunate enough for the moment to be able to focus on this and my kids. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you No, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I am really just how you raise two kids um, solo. I'm, I'm guessing. Um, yep. I think you're keeping private certain that uh, you want to tell me how you're, affording to to live and make theater in you know especially post pandemic so uh, i think it's wonderful that you're doing that by the way so but uh, you were you were talking more about um you know trying out the material if you will and doing the workshop up in the berkshires yep i did a workshop up here in the berkshires and it was great i was actually you know a friend of mine invited me to do it you know covid style in her backyard and about 40 people came and it was really wonderful. It felt good. I mean, I think that's part of the, you know, there's a whole thing that happens, right? Where you're like, I want to reclaim my childhood dream of performing. And then suddenly you realize you've signed yourself up for this thing. And are you even any good at it anymore? And I think the experience I had when I got on the stage was sort of the, it's like riding a bike, you know, it all clicked in. And like any um, theater loving kid who, needs attention as soon as that audience got in front of me it was like hello yes <laughs> <laughs> love me let me let me sh let me show you the ways did you get any either interesting advice or did people tell you their stories did you get any suggestions that like oh that's a good idea I'll, I'll add that or cut that from from doing all of that 
Um, all of that. Yeah. I mean, the one piece of, well, the one thing that's happened every time I've done this, because I've also done it in sort of smaller workshop settings is that people do come up to me and start telling me their story because this show is very much, it's about, I mean, it's very raw. I leave nothing. I, I, I mean, it's just very open. It's very raw. But it's kind of cool because I think that makes people feel like, hey, I can come up to her and start telling her my things too. And it's very much about like, you know, mother daughter relationships sort of from the perspective of being both a mother and a daughter and, you know, how being a mother informs my understanding of my own mother and just the complexities and, you know, and everyone is untangling their own relationships with their parents and their own relationships with their kids. You keep coming back to that. Is she still alive your mom uh, she is still alive do and we're very relation i mean do you do you see her do you talk to her do you what yeah i mean we're very we're very close you know like a good jewish mother and daughter we talk almost every day um and but there's always there's stuff you know there's stuff with mothers and daughters and i mean i see it i think there's stuff that's built into the relationship inherently i see it with my own kids and the things they project onto me by sheer virtue of the fact that i'm their mom um well don't baptize them for god's sake please do not do that i would or take them to a bob dylan concert <laughs> <laughs> Let me also ask you, um, you got a, um, a playwriting master's from the new school, yes? It was a fiction master's. Oh, it was, yes. it was creative writing, it was fiction writing. Yes. So what did you learn from doing that? I'm curious. Um, that there's no degree more useless than a, an MFA. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yes! I don't know why, I, I talked to my friend Dave whom you'll meet in about five minutes when he, when he takes over for the quiz. So yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. So, but you must have fun. I mean, did you write any stories that were pretty- Oh fun? yeah. I mean, I learned a lot about story. Um, and before I decided to make my big return to the stage, I, I had been writing, um, I, I've written a novel which has yet to be published. Oh. And I, I think retrospectively, I could probably go back to it and make it a lot better. I wrote it in my twenties. Um, Can you do that? Can you go back to something that you wrote so long ago and, and, or do you just have to, no, I can't, if that was me 20, I can't, I, no matter what, I have some ideas to change it. I'll have to write something completely new and different. I can change that. I think that might end up being right that you can't because I, for all the times I say, I'm going to go back to it. I just can't bring myself to, it's like a different version of yourself. You don't want to encounter. Now, the one thing I haven't mentioned about our guest in the neighborhood, Melanie Greenberg, whom you can see at United Solo Festival on Theater Row on October 29th. Well, well actually you can't because it's all sold out. But they're, they're, Well, they, they opened up more tickets for that show, actually. So you can go on the 29th, but you can also yes. go on November 6th and November 7th. It's right on uh, like 9th Avenue and 42nd Street. It's really easy to get to United Solo Festival for the Elephant in the room, the elephant in the, the room of this conversation that I haven't mentioned, that I didn't even know, that you don't seem to publicize very much, is that your grandpapa mm -hmm. is, is, oh my God, you know, when we, when we look at the thinnest books in the library, it's like, oh, great your <laughs> sports heroes. You mm -hmm. open up page one and your grandpa is on it because he was... Hank. Hank Greenberg. Hank Greenberg. You are the granddaughter of Hank Greenberg. Did you know him? Did you, uh, do you have any Hank Greenberg stories? I did know him. I mean, it's an interesting thing when your childhood hero is also like the hero to your people, um, which was very much the case for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up, he lived in Beverly Hills and I lived in, West LA and Pacific Palisades. So I grew up seeing him, but he was, you know, I heard there was all this mythology around him, but for he, me, he was Grandpa Hank. And he was just this kind of big, towering, charismatic guy. And so I grew up hearing the lore about him, but also just sort of had, he was the kind of guy you would have had your own mythology around if he was just your grandpa. Cause he was wow. like, you know, he was a commanding presence. 
a, a decent fella. You know, like uh, oh, people uh, really, really disappointed if they, you know, because you know you have heroes and especially sports heroes, and you know, they seem so great. And then you learn about them, and then, um, but yours, it sounds like he was actually someone that you're okay if people idolize him, and he's like, oh, Jewish baseball player, we love you, and, and we should. Oh, he was like all values. I mean, he grew he grew up in, you know, a religious Jewish household, and um, yeah, he was like. Uh, he was the real deal, you know, and I, and I, again, you know, this is me kind of probably stuck in my eight-year-old fantasy of him, but he was, he was a wonderful guy. I have nothing but great memories of him. And I still, I look to him as a, as one of my models as with my dad as well, who's his son, you know, of just like really impeccable integrity. Is, is that, that's, I don't know if that's the first time you mentioned your father, but you know, with so much has been about your relationship with your mother and, and it's kind of, how is, I mean, what was the relationship with your dad like? Does that even make it into the play very much? It does, but it's definitely more, I think because I am both a mother and a daughter, it's really about sort of this journey of figuring out that, you know, and I think that from what I hear, I have neither the experience of being a father or a son, but in that same way that there's sort of this complexity, you know, in that in that father son dynamic. So, I mean, I think I'm in, as I said, because I am both a, fa a mother and a daughter, I'm just sort of interested in that and sort of unraveling what all of that is. Now also, I, as, as we have maybe like a minute or two, cause we're waiting for our, our guests to come on and play the quiz in a, in a moment or so. But um, we also want to ask, Oh, what the hell was I going to ask? Now I've forgotten what the, oh, you, you, you put together a um, pilot of a, I did. of a TV episode. How's it going with that? It's, it's a comedy sitcom kind of pilot. You, mu you must have put a tremendous amount of time and energy and money into doing this. Where's it at? I mean, I did and I'm, you know, as a, I, I like to, I like to say that I, you know, I'm actively failing in all the arts because I have, I have my novel, I have my pilot. And look, it's like, I'm sure you can relate to this. You create and you keep trying to put things out into the world. And every time something doesn't go as planned, you think I'm never going to do this again, but you can't not because you're a creator. And so I just keep creating. And like I said, I'm showing my hope is, I also really believe I'm getting better as a creator. And my hope is that if one thing strikes fire, you know, the rest will come. And that's all it really takes. Because you had a YouTube, or we still technically have a YouTube channel. I don't know if you're posting any further uh, material on it. But it was kind of an interesting thing. You were kind of doing comedy while working out. Was that, oh, what yeah. I, was that it's a very weird thing. It's like, um, and with all the respect, it's, it's, it's amusing, but it's also very hard to watch because the camera's going like this and you're on a treadmill or you're running down the street. I'm like, ah! You know, I, I have to close my eyes to watch it, but but you got you got some likes on it. What, what was the impetus for that? You know, that was something that evolved. That started because my, I have a cousin and his friends who are, you know, 10 years younger than me and they're all really into exercise. So I made one as a joke for all of them. It was sort of like um, making fun of someone who might be giving an inspirational message while exercising and I sent it to them and they loved it. So I kept making them and then they started sharing them with some of their friends and it evolved out of that. And I just kind of created this character who was really uh, ridiculous. I guess what you might these days call an influencer, but who is always referring to relationships with celebrities and always, you know, kind of dropping this wisdom that doesn't really make any sense or, you know, have any bearing on reality. So I'm just, I'm just kind of curious, these are some of the things that the projects that you've been working on up until now when you're dealing with the elephant in the room. Do you have any, so you're going to get through, obviously, United Solo. What do you hope will happen after November 7th? I mean, I would love if someone would produce a run of the show in a, in a theater somewhere. That would be the ideal. It's easy to tour. It's like it's you. Uh, yeah, it's very. If there are any producers out there, there's nothing more cost efficient than a one person show. Basically, you would think, oh, oh, but this is this is a question that Dave got for his one person show. This is amazing. This is, this is it was like the one thing. Like 
it's your show. It's you. You wrote it. It's your personality. It's your persona. What do you think producers are going to ask you? The first thing they're going to ask about your show, if you're thinking of touring it or, or putting it up for three weeks or something like that, or, or weekends, in play, what do you think they're going to ask you? I will tell you, but go ahead. Take a guess. Oh, my goodness. I Well, I can't, something obviously I wouldn't think based on the buildup. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do, you know, do, do you what? Do you want a uh, herring and cream in your green room? What do they ask you? What they ask you is, do you have an understudy? I swear to you, if you put, you start shopping this show around, and you start but that makes sense from TR. It does. Well, it does because then, because what happens if you take ill or have an emergency? It's the whole show. Mm. Well, yeah, but you, you expect, uh, why don't they ask that of, of you know, uh, Michael Bolton when he does a concert? It's a good point, though, right? Oh, uh, yeah, Mike, Michael yeah. Bolton. Yeah, or <laughs> he's playing a, a solo, you know, a folk gig, David Bromberg or something like that. Then they ask David Bromberg, you know, if you're sick, uh, you know, can you get Charlie McCoy to play? No, it's like, no. It's like, do, people are paying to see this and you, and now suddenly it's like, well, I, I, I want to tell people, like, you want to understudy for me, you hire them. You're the producer. Why, why, when does that become my problem to find the person who's going to want me dead so they can get on stage? Right. <laughs> Think well, about it. I did that. have a producer ask me who I envisioned playing the role, and I was like, <laughs> what? What do, what do you These mean? not the brightest bulbs in the I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, they're smarter in certain ways, but sometimes you have to wonder if the, the bulb is flickering in, in the <sighs> skull lamps of their minds. Uh, and we've been talking with, man, here we go. Let's say, I'm, I'm, I've also been surreptitiously checking that we should get our guests in the neighborhood very, very shortly, very quickly. So I want to thank Melanie Greenberg for being with us. Don't go away. You stay there. I'm not going anywhere. But everybody, you get on the computer, get on your phone, get tickets to see her show, The Elephant in the Room. The room being one of the theaters in Theater Row. Do you know which theater it is? Do you know which uh, one of them? It's the Studio Theater. A Studio Theater on Theater Row as part of the United Solo Festival. And it's going to be on October 29th. There are tickets for that one. They, 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 there's so many people. And I say, ah, we can put more chairs in. You can, you can go. Or go on the 6th or the 7th. I'm sorry. In fact, on, on the Facebook page of Dave's Gone By right now, we've put the link. So you can just go right to the United Solo, right to the elephantintheroom.com. Melanie, it has been an absolute delight, even though you don't know your Hebrew name. This disappoints me. But I have to go. I wish you much success with the show. But Dave, the, the fellow who does this program, he will be right, right here. And he's going to take you through the quiz with our wonderful people who play the quiz every week. David Sheward and Leslie Hobang Blake. She's partly Jewish, so we, we allow it. You but allow it. Stay this is generous. Cool. Here's some Jew. This will bring back some memories. Here's some Judaism for you. No? Where the hell is it? I got to pot this up. Goddamn iTunes. Here we go. Ah, <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dave Lefkowitz here with more of the Dave's Gone By Facebookio Podcastio Programio of the stream and we are here with one of our guests and our other guests trying to join probably doing it by her phone and this time i was wrong i gave them the, a slightly wrong early call time but but you're here this is david sheward uh the former head of the drama desk former managing editor of backstage as well as a theater critic himself he, he writes for theaterlife.com culturaldaily.com and he has his own blog the david desk david sheward how are you doing Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, David. And uh, let me, oh, I should probably, I'm never good at this. I need to introduce you to Melanie Greenberg, who is an actress and uh, writer and has a solo show going up 
at the United Solo Festival that will be happening in a, well about two weeks from now. So hello, Melanie. Hello, David. Say hello. 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 Nice How to are you? Meet both of you, David. Good to see you. The day by. Nice you. Yeah. <laughs> the day by. Exactly. <laughs> And Leslie Hoban Blake will be joining us. She's literally, she's trying to, to log on. She's actually um, working on it. It takes her a bit. But David, how was your week? Uh, okay. Uh, let me see. What is going on? Uh, the Things are coming back, as it were. Uh, uh -huh. I saw, what did I see? I saw Lackawanna Blues. Oh, so you saw his, his speaking of coming back, how was his back? Uh, it seemed to be fine. He was moving around pretty good. Okay. Uh, that's Ruben Santiago Hudson. He had to cancel a few performances, uh, not COVID related. His back was giving him problems. And he's the only performer in this show he wrote and also directed, which is- uh, Should have had an understudy. <laughs> well, then it wouldn't be him. It's him. It's his right. story. You had to be there like five minutes ago to get that Yeah. yeah. Uh... And uh, I also saw letters of Suresh at Ooh. second stage. How was that? It was interesting. Uh, it was so. It was interesting. It was four people writing letters to each other, and it was kind of a bit like unbelievable that they would bear their souls to total strangers. It's one of those plays where, oh, I happen. You are. I saw you on the street in Chang in uh, Nagasaki a couple years ago, and I'm going to write you my whole life story in a letter, and we're going to become pen pals. And that happens back. though. That I, 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 I'm depending on the play. I would buy that because sometimes you tell. That's prison. <laughs> but, <laughs> Joy said that's prison. No, but um, sometimes you tell strangers a lot more than you would tell uh -huh. uh, somebody that you have to see every week or every day or something like that. You're kind of more open. And, and Melanie, you've written a play where you're telling a bunch of strangers yeah. the most deep, private, personal. I, I wrote a play about something you know bad that happened to my guts in a theater. So. You know. that happened well, it's easier to say. You know, I joke. It's easier to do it on a stage than it is to do it over dinner with people you know. So similarly, I think it can be easier to do it to an anonymous pen pal. Or to, yeah, to be um, an epistolary thing of like, I don't know, yeah. you, therefore I can tell you about these people I murdered, you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> my, my laundry is living here, you know, it's like whatever. Um, so, but it sounds like at least both shows were worth seeing. Did you like yes. Lackawanna? Yeah, I'm sure you've seen Lackawanna before. I have not. Yeah, which is, it's in, I, I couldn't believe it. it. It was off Broadway, like in, I think 2000 or something, uh, such a long time ago. Um, and today I'm going to see Dana H in the afternoon and the Lehman Trilogy in the evening. Oh, well, I'm seeing that. If I can, oh. I've got some seeing that tomorrow afternoon. So I'm looking forward, forward to it. Time about that one um did, yeah because because that that's was a not, major piece yeah i was not able to see dana h earlier because of covid and i was going to see it and then everything closed down so i'm really looking forward to it and deidre o'connell is one of my favorite actresses yeah we've been seeing her for like 30 something years she's really really good and it's it's amazing that you wait long enough these people oh, will always be off and off off broadway you'll never you know you'll still see them but they'll never be whatever. And then suddenly it's like, oh, wait a minute. They're, well, people yeah, know she, them. Yeah. She's one of these performers who was not a star, quote unquote, but is a really fine actress. And you uh, see her in theater quite a bit and on movies and television occasionally. And she's always very, very reliable and, and, and very good. No, but, uh, you know, who was I thinking of? Oh, of um, Anne Dowd. Oh yeah, well, Anne, 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 I used to see her at Irish Rep. I used to see her in tons of things off Broadway, and, and, just, and she was so good, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but nobody's ever going to know who the hell Anne Dowd is. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, like when we we're in Colorado, the a woman that my wife worked with, they said, "Oh, she's one of my favorite actresses." I mean, how you? Because she was doing all this TV, and she was, and suddenly and now she's like, "Oh, everybody knows who she is." Well, it's the Handmaid's the Tale. She's, she's Aunt Lydia. In what? In the Handmaid's Tale. Oh, I said, okay. There. That's why she's I was, famous. I was just she was in Law and Order for a bunch of times, and she was yes, doing. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, what were, we, what were you going to oh, say? Oh, I was going to say, I was just telling someone yesterday about how I saw Mindy Kaling in, what was it, Ben and Matt? Did either right, of you remember that? Yeah, 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 like yeah. PS 122, right mm -hmm. when she was out of college. Right. You know, it's just funny. You go to see something off Broadway or off off Broadway, and then, you know, when the person emerges a decade later and is this right. huge superstar, it's yeah. it's a funny it's funny to see that it's cool to see the progression. Yeah, in the early days. Of, oh, sorry. Yeah, 
I was like Jesse Tyler Ferguson was doing small, he was like, like supporting role. He was the gay best friend in all of these off Broadway shows. And then all of a sudden he's a big television star and set for life. <laughs> what, what, um, what were they uh, in, must be not 25, 30 years ago now. And if you went downtown to like UCB, there's, there was a show called Dratch and Faye. I never got to see it. Oh, like, it's not pretty, two young women doing comedy sketches. All right. Well, well it was it was Rachel Dratch and Tina Fey. Uh, and then wow. there you go. So who knows? Melanie, maybe, maybe you stick with it. There you go. Could I happen. mean, isn't that what we all tell ourselves? Yes. Keep going. <laughs> 89, I'll be like, if I just keep doing the show, I <laughs> Uh, you I'm need that delusion to keep yeah. going on. I'm, 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 she's trying. She's trying to get on. She's, yeah. she's, um, she, I'm trying to admit her again. Uh -huh. Fingers While we're doing that, let me tell Melanie the rules of the game. La regla, as as Rabbi Sal would say, la regla de Jew. Here's here's the uh, the rule of this game. It's called today, yesterday, and it's a trivia quiz. It's not just uh, about theater. It's a, a history quiz. The idea. And so almost all the questions, not all, have to do with something that occurred in history on this date, on October 16th. Wow. Could be 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and so forth. A couple of questions on more current event. -y. But, oh, oh, I see Leslie's nose. Hey, Leslie, great nostrils. Now, pot down so I can at least see more, uh, you know, some and shoulders and boobs. There we go. Yeah, and you're muted. Well, well yeah, well, first letter is let's see her. Now we can unmute. Unmute, Les. Unmute. Okay. Yes! Yeah. She made it. I've been trying to do this since since before 11.10. I know. I saw you trying to get right up until about five minutes ago, just on time. And I know. Thank you. I just want that to be on the record. It is on the record. By the way, you look great. I love that outfit. That You just look so stylish. What? Something about black and I'm wearing a pair of pajamas and I threw this over it. <laughs> I would not have known. That's, that's, that's a pro move. You can do that. <laughs> yep. Hey, I'm Good wearing morning, a Good morning, Melanie. Am I right? You can throw this on and it looks fine on Zoom, it's, right? It's a total pro move. Exactly. <laughs> By the way, Leslie, that is Melanie Greenberg. She is a writer and actress. She is going to be doing a solo show at the United Theater, I'm uh, sorry, United Solo Festival on October 29th, November 6th and 7th. It's called The Elephant in the Room. And and um, everybody duck. Well, I have to know what The Elephant in the Room is, number one. Well, well number two, it, I... Go ahead. No, 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 I want to hear two. No, I worked on a show with a fellow critic uh, last year, two years ago. I've forgotten last, there was no last year. The year before, the year that wasn't. Um, and he did his solo show there as well. So it's a great place oh, to work. Very wonderful. convenient. It's easy to get cut people to get, providing you have a good guest list, it's easy to get people to come in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, here's now, the, thing. Her the first, elephant in the room. Her first show well, on October 29th was sold out. And they put some more chairs in there. And so she's got two other dates, November 6th and 7th. Excellent. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the people I'm were the demanding bread. more chairs. <laughs> there, there were riots <laughs> were sure. in, in Midtown <laughs> over it. It was like Les Miserables and the sign said say, more chairs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They're building a barricade one outside one the chair. theater. <laughs> well, the turntable, too, of course. Uh, exactly. That's a big feature but, but of my show. But it works show. because it says just one more chair, right? That's the name of the song. Never mind. Yeah, right. Anywho, <laughs> empty um, tables. So what is the empty chairs with empty tables? Yes. The one question that we didn't ask, and, and you don't have to say, but do you tell what people the what the elephant in the room? Because it sounds like you're a heard know. of elephants in your story. Well, so, there are a lot of elephants in a lot of rooms in my story, but my show opens with a story about how when I was in elementary school. I, you know, I grew up in uh, in the Pacific Palisades, but I went to this birthday party in in Beverly Hills, and one of the kids at the party had a circus themed birthday party and brought an elephant and had wow. an elephant in their backyard. Wow! And so the elephant sort of becomes, and I'm sort of talking about how I was a kid and just horrified. You know, I'm looking, I'm like, they have a captive animal and it's in a costume and people are running around. And the elephant sort of becomes a sim, like the symbol for my existential angst. It's oh, and sort yeah. of a symbol for my own feeling of being trapped and captive in some of the environments that I was in. 
Um, I guess so the were, elephant in the room is a literal elephant in the room, wow. as well as a symbolic one. Yeah. Not, not to mention an, a, a symbol of wealth beyond measure and dreams, right? That's that's exactly. Wow. She was in elementary school. Uh, I thought that too, David, but I didn't say it. <laughs> that's uh, wonderful restraint, Leslie. Uh, <laughs> um, Michelle, quick question: the Melanie, Pacific Melanie, Palisades, Melanie. is that a, is that near Ber is that near Berkeley? Is that the ones above Berkeley? Or oh no, is this wrong? is Southern California? It's okay. sort of in the Sorry. Malibu area. Okay, got you. Well, now she's in the Berkshires. I got you. I I. Yeah, where okay. are you in the Berkshire? Are you near the Berkshire Theater Festival? Where are you? Uh... I am. I'm in Great Barrington, oh. which is not far oh. from there. Cool, cool. Right. Are you a regular there? Did you know Julie Boyd? I know of Julie Bo Boyd. I don't know her. I mean, we all know I, I of go, Julie that's Boyd. My, that's, my, that's my connection. I, I'm a director, and she was our president for a while. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm sure. sorry, I did not mention that. Leslie Hoban Blake, theatrical director. She is also a video podcaster with our mutual friend Charlie Gross on the show Critics Circle that you can watch on YouTube. And of course, old episodes of Two on the Now, here's the deal, Leslie. Now that you guys are, well, no, you're not going to the theater yet, are you? You're not yet. No. No. Okay. So, so David on came on as a guest host. And for theater shows, there will be guest hosts. Dave, uh, Brian Scott Lipton, I think, is going to come on. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm going to ask Diane. Anyway, the point is, uh, we put a little slurp, blurb up saying that until I'm not immunocompromised, which should be around January, February, because it is a, there's a finite time, that there yeah. will be guest hosts yeah. sitting on the aisle in my place. So, um, but I'm still doing the streaming. We're covering, we're covering Diana. We're going to cover Dear Evan Hansen. I mean, there's plenty for me to work on on the show. Great. We just put up our, our Tony Awards. Our Tony Awards are just, they're on, they're on, they're already on YouTube, but they're just, they went up on the station. So look so, at the YouTube channel, Critics Circle, to watch the show. Okay, let's, let's, um, let's do the quiz. Let's get on to Thank you for the, for the, for the yeah. long involved. <laughs> plug. I do, yeah. Plug. Here, plug, that's the word, plug. So here's the rules. Um, it's a trivia quiz, three rounds. Each person gets a question individually. The question is worth two points if you get it right. If you get it wrong, um, you don't lose anything, but one of the other contestants gets to try and steal. The question and get those two points and then um, we have a tiebreaker which and which we do whether there's a tie or not we just do it for fun by the way um melanie do you happen to have a pen or pencil or crayon and a piece no. of paper or do i need that you will well, not immediately you prick your finger and write in blood it's uh, okay. right in blood exactly Actually, considering your show you probably dig one up with ago, but yeah, but do it now <laughs> Um, I, let me see if I, could I just want to say that Dave Lefkowitz would be the would be one of the guest co-hosts, except he's not going back to the theater yet either. Except I am tomorrow, Leslie. I'm seeing the Lehman what? trilogy. Tomorrow I'm oh. seeing the Lehman. So. Oh, but 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 I think did you did you guys already do that one? I don't know. Who, I think Dave. I think I think I think Charlie. Well, Dave's actually seeing that, that show but, tonight. So we did. Um, no, we did Sanctuary City. Drop Dave. Drop Charlie a note and tell him that you're, you're seeing that because I'm yeah. sure he'll want it. Dave used to be a regular on the show, so that's why I say yeah. that. I was not, I, I was always a guest. I was never really a regular, but they invited me on quite a lot. So, so and I, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the invite. Uh, sure, to like Marshall Wallace on Match Game. <laughs> yeah. So, is everybody ready to play? Speaking of, of games, I'm ready. Yes. I have my pen. Joyce is saying that I was never regular. And I'm like, hey, I crapped twice this morning. Before this I morning. was, I knew that was going. That was quite a set. That was. Don't say the number two. Don't just don't give him any clues. That's, don't, don't. I knew which direction I was going in. There we go. They'll find them anyway. It's okay. Now, Melanie, can you kindly do me a favor? Could yes. you kindly pick a number between two, one? Sorry, between one and six, and tell me what okay. it is. Four. Melanie with a big four. Okay, and I wasn't gonna say two. Okay. <laughs> See how quick she is. She's quick. I love this woman. Uh, <laughs> Leslie Hoban Blake. Since I'm being Dave, David, I'm sorry, you David, but I'm not, next. You know, I, I don't believe in this, you know, misogynistic. All the women go first. If you want to go next, it's fine with me. David, I will let you go next. If you otherwise, want to go next. otherwise, I will take the, 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 the I will take my chance. But if you want to go, 
Trumping it a bit. I I don't care, but I will do it. Uh, to okay. No, no. If you don't care, then I'll take it. It's fine. Okay. I'm, I'll take six. Thank you. No, because he'll take my number. Leslie's always six, taking six. What do you want, David? You, you don't want six, David, do you? Yeah. I want three. Oh. Leslie giveth and Leslie taketh away. I want I want three. Three. David Sheward goes for three. So I have Melanie with four, Leslie with six, David Sheward with three. What we're going to do right now is oh I'm going to dig up my my brand. I'm going to try a different roll of die because uh, there was always a pain. I got hit like three times. So it's a a, um, a digital dice rolling thingy. So I hit the die. That should oh, noise. makes a noise. It came oh. up number three. So, David Sheward, do you have the option? Do you want to go first, second, or third? I'm going to go second. Ooh. Ooh. This is ooh, a everybody. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. That's a, no, it's a strategy, right? A strategy is plural and strategy yeah. is singular. Okay. I, I'll get that before yes. I okay, get no, that right. The captain <laughs> needed a strategy. How, how does that happen, Boris? You take the rope and stretch it across, and we have strategy. Oh, I don't, what? What? I don't understand that. All right. But, I don't understand uh, they're, that one either. <laughs> they're trying to trap Rocky and Bullwinkle. So they mm. take a long rope and they stretch it across a tree and they're going to trap them in the, with the rope. And it is strategy. The, the stretch I it still don't get it. I, don't, I still don't get this. That's David if he was watching cartoons this morning. Yeah, were, were, you, were you watching uh, Warner Brothers before you logged on? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, yeah. oh. Why would this day? Why would this day be different from any other day? <laughs> there, this is, this there was is one that would be very offensive to Italians. Uh, they were very exaggerated Italian characters going like this. All right. So here's the deal. I rolled a five before. That was between Melanie and Leslie. So I, I had to disallow that one. But I just rolled a three, which is David's number, but it's second closest to Melanie. So Melanie, you get to choose. Do you want to be first or third? I don't know what I'm getting into, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go third. Okay. Like, clever girl, like That's a warm up, smart thing up to round. do. Yeah. <laughs> and, Mary, this I, this is a woman after my own heart. She yeah. she she knows all the right things to do. Yeah. I, I obviously am going to go first, which I usually want to do, but now it's like I'm left with it. I don't even nobody even wants it anymore. So so here's the deal. This is I, I do. Joyce reminded me though to tell you, Melanie, that a um, lot of first timers, newbies to the game. They're lucky if they even get two points because it's a weird, ridiculous trivia game. It's it's and it's not easy, and, and some of the questions are intentional. Like no what shade. the? There's no shade. Well, I watched one round just because when someone says oh. I'm going to do trivia, I want to know, and I was comforted. Just, I was comforted by the fact that you asked a question that no one could answer. So I was like, we're all going <laughs> to just be times. equally, yes. hum, you know, it's not like I'm going to be humiliated alone. It'll just right. be impossible. Has anybody else oh. ever studied for this test? <laughs> I, I not only like this woman, I'm madly in love with you, and I will have your children, except I'm too old. Well, well, Leslie, I have two that you can just help me raise as a compromise. <laughs> I've done that. My kid's birthday is in December, and I'm not going to tell you what decade he's about to enter. I'm not, not going to do it. It's Leslie, I do think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I'm uh -huh. sensing it. I, I would hope so, yes. <laughs> All right. Here we go. This Wait, is the beginning of a... wins the game. <laughs> That's true, too. Oh, this I, is I, very competitive. And and David is yeah, very, the game is over. Yeah. But David is also sort of the most of the time the reigning champ. Leslie has won a few times, but David is like the guy to beat. He's sort of the David is the guy right. to beat. The guy to beat. He's the bag of Mogi Oak uh, kind of guy. All right, let's, let's form an alliance, Leslie. Oh, ah. <laughs> I always do with just about any woman who comes on, but you're you're really in my top. One at the moment. I like that. Don't blow it, Melanie. It's my favorite ranking. I know. Maybe I'll just stop talking so I can't mess it up. I have my goose. I don't have my duck. I have a goose. Uh, All right. Wait, I'll go this way. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, David, do it again. Do it again. So with that, I want them to kiss. Wait. Put it close. Oh. Am I supposed to have? Oh no, yours is going. Yeah, to, you I don't know. Okay, never mind. <laughs> We're in the wrong oh, position. Is, but... Oh, what do you have? Whoa! I know. Oh, no. <laughs> ugly, what's that? An ugly thing? Person. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I like love Kermit's it. worst nightmare. What the hell is that? I don't, I I don't know what it is. <laughs> I've seen them. I think it's, it's, it's a, a dog toy. It's a slightly dead thingy that I think based on a frog given its color. Oh. <laughs> I've, seen them. I've seen those. Yeah. It looks like, is that like a, a virus? 
I, oh, that could be COVID. That could be the actual. This is COVID. It's how I throw all of my competitors well, off their game. Well, <laughs> can you imagine somebody having a, a, a toy that they call COVID? That would be insane, right? Yeah, David, what? Our okay. dog. Here, COVID. Here, COVID. Co COVID has spi a spiky, would have a spiky head. It's oh, true. A lot of things poking out. But I think they do make actually COVID out toys. Of space. Right, little... All right, so anyway, shall okay, we, shall all we go finished. Ahead? Come on. All right, let's start a game. Uh, you know, we're doing a trivia game here at some point. It's called Today, Yesterday, the Quiz. And so Leslie gets the very first question. Do you want to say the backstory that these are things that could have happened today or have some? Yes, he said that. Yes, he said if it weren't for Joyce, uh, poor, poor Melanie would that. know what the hell was going on. He said that. <laughs> we still don't know what the hell is going on. It's, it's my show. It's, it's called yeah. Day by. Nobody knows what goes on. Yeah, he said that. The did year. You say that. He did. The year was 1847. Okay, uh, Leslie. Leslie, this question is yours. Published today by Smith Elder and Company is the Gothic romance Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. According to the History Press, which of these is not true? Which about, is false, false. Which is false about Charlotte Bronte? Thank a, you, Joyce. She owned a piece of Napoleon's coffin. B. When young, Bronte was a teacher, uh, and she was a teacher, she was frequently reprimanded for being too open and lenient with her students. Mm -hmm. C, Bronte wrote passionate love letters to a married school headmaster who tore them up, only to have his wife put them back together. <laughs> or D, they didn't have scotch tape then. <laughs> the first time Bronte met her idol, William Makepeace Thackeray, at dinner, they were both so awkward, he ate four before he heard them say anything. Okay, so we have coffin. Right. Wait, we have coffin, leniency, letters, and and potatoes. Yeah, exactly. Right. We eating four potatoes before they could. Doesn't eat matter. Them. I just need to get it straight in my head. Thank you. Yeah. Give me a second to cogitate, please. <laughs> Not on camera. Play your xylophone quietly, quietly. I did see the the David Sherwood. I did see the Ida Lupino movie about the Bronte sisters oh. and the Bronte brother. None yeah. of this was in it, so <laughs> I move on from there. Okay. Wasn't Howard Duff in it? Her future husband, or is it that? It wasn't Howard Duff. It was um um. Howard the Duck? No, he wasn't in that. No. Howard. Stern. Now I'm going to be thinking of who was in it. Thank you, David. Okay. Let me finish this, and I'll tell you who was in it. Uh, that's a second. Do I get points if I tell him who was in it? <laughs> hey, that's a new strategy, distraction. That's it, that's it. Okay, let me just go back. I will get Dr. Sue. <laughs> I will sue Dr. Sue. I don't think that she was particularly lenient. I'm sure she sent a love letter. Um... The only quiet. I don't think she. I don't think she had a piece of the coffin. I think A is wrong. A is not. Notice how how Joyce helped me fix a little. Oh, look at that! It's whole again. It's finally. Yeah. Again. I listen. Listen. Listen to the tone. Huh? Huh? Beautiful. Oh, so next thing is our think. Our, our it's time for an answer music. Your answer, Leslie, is A. She, it's not, it is not true that she owned a piece of Napoleon's coffin. Well, Leslie, I'm afraid you've made a grave mistake. She actually did own a piece of Napoleon's coffin that was, yeah. Um, she worshipped Napoleon, so her headmaster at the school gave it to her as a gift. He had somehow a piece of it. So, we I was going to say, I bet it, it's like, it's like Christ's bones or the nails in his feet. There are like billions of them oh. around. So go ahead. Talismans and all the yeah. yeah. I'm going to roll yes. the dice. Yes. All right. So. Can I steal? How does this work? Can I steal it? Both, well, here's the, deal. the dice. I just roll the three. Okay. Which is and David's number. So it's my eight. number. So okay. if it were a four, you could steal. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. So that leaves. She was. She got reprimanded by her principal for being too lenient. Right. Uh, and open with her students. Or. And, and, she, or she, she sent a love letter to a married man, her principal, or her uh, who <laughs> tore it up, and the wife pieced it all together. 
Mm -hmm. Or she had dinner with William Makepeace Thackeray, author of Vanity Fair, and they were both so awkward that he ate four potatoes. Before they even- Excellent, said David. He should get a half a point just for that. That was a so great- I think that it, it makes sense that she, the, the first part, the, the one about being too lenient, that sounds exactly like what happens in Jane Eyre. Um, so I think that's true. The third thing about the letters being sent and torn up, that sounds true also. And maybe he ate three potatoes instead of four. I was, I was gonna go initially with what Leslie said with the uh, Napoleon thing, but um, it's, it's gone. So the one that sounds great most, minds think alike. Go ahead. The one that sounds most fake or fakey to me is the William Makepeace Thackeray one. So I'll guess that. Is that your final answer? Yes. Oh, David, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. But your answer was in vain there. That is not the correct answer. So right. Melanie, you have a 50-50 shot of stealing this question. So you have two choices. Well, I'm going to go with the answer that I was have, would have gone with had they all, because the Napoleon thing was so specific. I felt it had to be true. You know, I don't know. So random, but I felt it had to be true. Um, I'm going to say that I don't think she was, although what you say is true about what you got in. It's what's not true. Sorry. You're picking up Yeah, no, no, what? I understand. What's yeah, I, I, I just had a moment of self-doubt. I had the one I was going to answer and then I, I might've changed my mind. Um, all right, I'm gonna say that the letters to her principal. That didn't happen. That, that's not true. No, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna say that she, that the leniency thing was not true. Is that your final answer? I, you, if we, as long as we sit here, I'll keep changing my answer. So let's call it my final answer. Okay, so you're you're saying that which one is not true? That she was that, that she. I'm going to say that she was not lenient. Well, I I hate to be stirring with you, but you're right. That is the the incorrect. That what happened? Was, okay. Yes. I had a moment of self doubt because Leslie, I was thinking like you, I didn't, I couldn't see her being lenient. And then what you said, David, about the book, but that I thought maybe that's a red herring. Uh, I don't think you need to know the, the, yeah. the insanity in my brain. Yeah. Well, I got the right answer. Gooba gaba, gooba gaba. She is one of us. She thinks out loud. I, <laughs> she's one of us. Yeah. Well, she's Leslie's speaking in public. She's speaking out loud. Really? That's from I, I, know. I know. That's why I'm making I, a face. An elegant person just says the right answer and leaves it at that. But I had to <laughs> take you there in the clunkiest way possible. But here's the deal. Here's, here's, here's the trivia behind this question. First of all, Charlotte Bronte hated teaching, despised her wow. students. She wow. once wrote, um, just then a dog came to me, up. I was a teacher. Yeah, well, just <laughs> <that adult, laughs> the lesson, I thought I should have vomited. <laughs> I'm sorry. My students, come on. She, not, you're not Charlotte Bronte. Um, and what else was the thing? Oh, oh. and the, the thing about the letter. So uh, she wrote these letters to uh, to the headmaster. His, his wife found them. Uh, you know, he tore them up. His wife found them. She she sewed them together because there wasn't scotch oh tape. My God. And her son ended up donating them to the British Museum. Wow! Wow! This isn't that cool? Wow! So wow. she's the opposite of Jane Eyre. Yes. That I did not it. hate my children, by the way. They were the, they, I, I grew to love the whole concept. I didn't want to be a teacher, but I loved it after a while. Yay. You have to Yay. say that. But okay, here we go. We have not that anybody cares. Now, check this out. I warned Melanie that, you know, people generally, a lot of times when they're new to the game, they don't get any points. They don't get, you are in the lead. Yeah. Melanie has two points as we begin. I'm in the lead. I have two very loud dogs in the background, which is why I'm muting myself. Oh, until I hopefully. Them? Oh, you can't oh, hear them. Oh, yes. Now, I can now, now that you pointed oh, yes, out. Yes. Right. Now that I pointed them out. So, um, right. okay. 
but at least so I'm gonna walk away having not totally humiliated myself. That's okay. that's I'm always that's always my that. bottom oh, line in any interact. I want to walk away having not been totally humiliated. Okay. So mission accomplished. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Nobody's ever done that either. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have a question. We have a question now that goes directly to David Sheward. Okay, because David goes second in the and, and we're still in our first round. Here, okay. David's question. I remember these are things that happened October 16th in history. 1925 was okay. the year. The Texas, what, what? David's in a different part of his room. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, I, just seen, my, I just turned my chair. Oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> the Texas. It's an interactive, like you are there kind of play, right? There it is. Oh, there he right. goes. The uh, zooming in the round. Yeah. <laughs> the Texas State Textbook Board bans evolutionary theory from all its textbooks today. According to factinate.com, which of these is not true about evolution? A, hiccups are a carryover from our ancestors, the fish. B, the lacrimal caruncle, that small pink nodule in the corner of your eyes, comes from our reptile ancestors. C, humans share 60% of the same genes as a banana. Or D, people who can wiggle their ears are a carryover from our insect ancestors. Oh, those are all very interesting. Uh, Only one of them is false. Okay, the, the, okay so hiccups are come from fish. The corner of our eyes come from reptiles. We share 62 genes with bananas. 60% of the same genes as a banana. As, bananas. as a banana. And what was the last one? Uh, people who can wiggle their ears are oh. carry over from our insect ancestors. Huh. Well, I think that the hiccups and fish are real. I don't know why I just think so. The corner of the eye thing, I think is true because if you look at a reptile's eyes, they do have this kind of funny little thing there. Um, and they look a little bit like a basset hound. Um, let me see what else. Uh, <laughs> Or like Droopy the dog on the Tex Avery cartoons. Uh, the banana, that's really, what genes would we have in common with the banana? Or the, the will your ears and insects? Bananarama? Okay. They're actually well, Dash genes that we're coming, uh, yeah. I'm gonna say uh, the banana is not true. Is that your final yeah. answer? Yes, yes it is. Well, David, sure, you are not monkeying around. That is not the correct answer, I'm afraid. We do share, gene, not DNA, but we, we share gene, genetic material uh, with a banana. So we does have a- that make us all cannibals then? Oh, I guess it does. It makes us appealing. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, well, that, explains, that explains Charles Nelson Riley on the big banana commercials. I don't remember. Oh, really? Well, what did he say? That. Come on, tell us what he said. Oh, no, nothing. It was just Charles Nelson Riley did a series of commercials for pens, which were called Big Bananas. Oh, so Big. He, I thought you said for Big, big Bananas. I'm so yeah, sorry. I see. Big, big Bananas. <laughs> you know what they bananas. say about the, the size of a bit of yes. Yes. banana. Uh -huh. and, when did, <laughs> and when he did Neil Simon's God's Favorite, they he wrote in a Big Banana joke. That show okay. is not a hit. Oh. You know, <laughs> wow. Wow. Ah. The die rolls and it comes up boxcar number six. Leslie, you have a steal. Oh boy, I get to steal. All right. Um, so it's a question of whether it's fish, insects, or snakes. Um, we are not in any of the same genus as those things. Yeah. I mean, we are mammals and none of those are mammals that I know of. Um, wait a minute. No, they're reptile. That's a reptile, and a, a fish is a fish, and an insect is an insect. So, or I had no idea. That this, I, know, I, I was about to break into some. Aren't you lucky I didn't? Um, there, there are evidently one of them has. Is, is this which one is true or which one is false? Which one is not true. Okay, I Thank would you. say that we are furthest away from insects. It, it's just a question of. What are we? What are we closest to? What are we furthest away from? I would think. So. Oh, insect. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. What's the buzz? The buzz is Leslie Obang Blake. You got that right. You get two points. 
we did we got the ear wiggling from animals now ah. we'll, we'll be able to point their ears to to various directions in, in the direction of sound not now see that's from years of teaching fifth grade science where you go through but i never heard of being related to those that's a specific a specificity we didn't get into so i don't know it yeah. But, I know fifth grade science. That's what I know. Yeah. Well, the eye thing, as as David was intimating, that that, that weird extra eyelid that right. the, the things have that, that this is a remnant apparently of that. Mm. And hiccups. There's a, a thing involving from the way fish breathe. It's just a carryover of the gills. But then, and I know that we don't have time for a, for a, a conference on on uh, uh, <laughs> evolution, but. Does that mean that then we are actually related to those other species that we are not part of? Well, I guess, yeah. I mean, that's what it's saying. It's bananas. saying that we get this to from bananas. them and this from them. 50 million and, they, years and the species yeah. broke bananas, down in such a way that we're not related to any of them. Bananas, what, reptiles, and fish. <clears throat> yeah. All, li those are not, all life. We're mammals. All, all life is from the sea. So that may be where that comes from. Oh, you know it. what? That's it, David. You got yeah. it. And insects are on land, so you got it. The insects came after, I guess. Every once in a while, we'll get a bunch of bananas at the store, and I'll see one that looks like my grandmother, and I'll be like, oh, you know, there you go. It's How hard is it? That's Nana so-and-so, right? Yeah. Nana! That's it, Nana! Nana. Oh. I, know. I, wow. I said it. I know, I know, I know. Now, here's totally a Freudian slip, Nana. wasn't it? And that's also, oh. a, that's also a Nana yeah. joke. Well, Freudian slip on the banana peel. That was... Right. Oh. It's, it's a double whammy. I got that was, uh, that was Olive Oil's mother, Nana Oil. Oh. No, that's the truth. And Roberta Maxwell... Was it really? And Roberta oh, Maxwell played her in the movie. Who? No, Roberta Maxwell. Some... Yeah, Roberta, Roberta, Maxwell. Maxwell. Well, I, Roberta Maxwell played Olive Oil's mother in Popeye you. with Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall. Oh, I did. Okay. Wow. The only thing I know Roberta Maxwell from is Ashes. Honest to God, I don't yeah. remember. And then later on, I saw her as a really yeah. older it was person. Nana Oil, Castor Oil. Oh, that's cute. Uh, and what was the father's name? Well, anyway, played by McIntyre Dixon, but I don't remember. Shell or something. Oh, no, I don't know that. That's Coco. Yeah. Castor <laughs> Oil was her brother. Played by, come on, finish it up. I don't by. remember who played her brother. Oh, Very you remember David everything. Short. I never saw that whole movie. Is it worth seeing Popeye, Robert Altman's Popeye? You're a Robert Altman fan. It is fan. now. It wasn't then, it is now. Now it's hysterical. At the, at the time, it was a big bore. But now if you look back at it and see who's in it and who's doing what, yeah. it's Linda an hysterical Hunt, Linda rock. Hunt is in it. That's a it's great a distinction, rock. Leslie. Yeah, there are, there are movies that are, yes. aren't good for real, but are good as sort Linda of historical Hunt artifacts. Is, and uh, it wasn't even not good enough to be like a camp favorite at the so time. Bill Irwin is in it. Uh, Dennis Franz but is in it. If you go back and you you see everybody, you... Was Dennis Franz was Wimpy? Or, or, yeah. Dennis Franz was one of the, 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 the ruffians on the waterfront <laughs> that Popeye beats up. Yeah, so he wasn't going to be at all. Not Pluto. Yeah. No. Um, we have we have a now. Here's the deal, Melanie. Since you mm -hmm. watched a round, God forbid you should watch an entire episode of my show, but you watched a round of trivia to prepare for this. Did do you know what three clues in the news is? Well, I've I've got to tell you, I didn't watch even a whole round. I watched a snippet of a. <laughs> I'm a single mom. It's not personal. I don't have a lot of sun, uh, Saturday morning. <laughs> well, here's the deal. We have a different kind of question that we do ask, because this question now goes to you. Oh, and I, that's the one I got. If I had known, maybe I wouldn't have opted to go third. But what well, can you do? Go. I've that's already good. realized that the best way to win this game is to, you know, steal, because you have fewer <laughs> choices left. Yes, but, exactly. Mm. All right, I'm well, with that's you. That's why you were so smart clue. to pick second. Right. You know, I that was a really smart choice of where to go. Well, thank you, Leslie. It, it's, it's very David's affirming. It's David's <laughs> algorithm, but it, it it really is. But to know that off the bat is really good. It's um, you're gonna be in New York, right? We have to have coffee. <laughs> I know, <laughs> Leslie. This this really, I think we've got something special going. Okay. Because okay. yeah. Melanie's gone way down in my estimation now, and there's oh, I watched part of a round of your oh. show. <laughs> It's only been on for 19 fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, can I tell you something for real? Day? I mean, this will also bring me down in your estimation, but will help you take it less personally. I'm not on Facebook. 
Me I'm either. like that much of a, like not connected with, the, you know, obviously this is a huge Facebook sensation, but I'm not on Facebook. So hopefully, you know. Obviously I have a website called davesgoneby.com <laughs> with 19 years of archives. <laughs> well, now I know, I but how would I have found YouTube. out about it if I didn't uh, now, yeah, believe me? What do you think I'm going to be doing the rest of the weekend? <laughs> I watch him on YouTube after we're posted and he always does. And I'm not on Facebook either. So I, I have a, it's a built-in excuse, even if you, you know, but you now, but now it. I know, I mean, I, I, I wasn't aware of you, but now that I can't, I can't be punished for what I didn't know. Yeah, you can. You're Jewish. All right. <laughs> okay. Here, here's your question. It's called. That's rule Jewish. number five, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Here we go. Here we go. Three, what, let me explain what three clues in the news is. Um, there are three words that I will throw at you. They are not connected to each other, but each of these words is connected to the word that we're looking for. So it could be blank word or word blank. And the word that we're looking for has something to do with something that went on in the news this week. So I'll give you an example of how the, the, the question would work. So if I were to say, um, sweet couch vegetable, what word would pop into your head? Sweet like, couch vegetable? No, no, remember, they're not related potato? to each other. Oh, I see it. Okay, potato, right. Sweet potato, couch potato, potato is a vegetable. So those- Yes, got it. Okay, okay understood. Each other. Got it? All right, here's okay, how- Okay, got it. All right. Your three clues in the news are mm -hmm. fantastic, obvious, Crunch. Captain. Is that wow. your final answer? It sure is. <gasps> I guess you are chewish because I hear you crunch, crunch, crunching. I, was that too obvious, guys? Was that too easy? It was, yeah, a little. Captain. Well, I got it. I, I, that. <laughs> I hadn't gotten it yet. I'm sorry. I, I'll be honest. I hadn't gotten it yet. And I might have, but I hadn't gotten it. Can I say what the news connection is? Go for it. Because uh, William Shatner, 90 years old, went into outer space as the oldest person to be in space, and he played Captain Kirk. There you go. There you, well done. Well done. I'm sorry you don't take a point. He wore his from... uniform under his, under his uh, outside thingy, right? He Didn't he wear his, his uh, Star Trek? I don't know. Maybe. But Did you well... see the saddest thing in the world was when he came down. There was some, there was some uh, footage of this on one of the shows. The footage all the news shows showed was Elon Musk and him talking, and it was blah, 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 like that. Um, but there was a piece of footage where there were some noisy younger people on the side making a lot of noise, and Shatner is trying to talk, and Elon Musk is paying attention to the younger people, and poor Shatner is standing there, kind of like with nobody to talk to. He's just come down from space. <laughs> so whoever show it was on had him beamed up. It was really funny. It might have been. It might have been Trevor Noah, but it was real oh, funny. I get it. Except for the beaming. Yeah, well, it was, that and funny. it was so sad. Yeah, that is sad. Anything? Yeah. It's just, it's not like but on the regular stuff. shows, they showed you know they showed him talking and everything was hunky dory. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, here's what's hunky dory about. Congratulations. Our today yesterday quiz. Melanie is in front. She is leading. So I'm like a prodigy. Is this is like amazing. This is, Absolutely. This is so I've gone from wanting to not totally humiliate myself to to being in the now anything can happen because we have two more rounds. Yes, we right. have rounds of this people. Yeah, take it away from her. The woman hasn't even had a chance to bask and you're taking it away from her already. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. I was basking in the warm. <clears throat> Let her bask. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have time French for a minute and, and bask. No time for basking. We have no We're time on the clock. <laughs> My opportunities right. for basking are so rare. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> knock, Miss Davenport. Yeah. <laughs> no, but here's the deal, um, Melanie. You have to. If you're going to do that, you've got to be kind of apart from us, because then you would be a Basque separatist. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's oh, Japan. Uh, uh, Is that a QAnon theory? <laughs> oh, Mr. Peabody. We, we're going to round two, and not a moment too soon, let me tell you, um, with a question for Leslie Hoban Blake. All right, Leslie, this is again a sort of a slightly different question. Today happens to be on the calendar National Bosses Day. In honor of bosses everywhere, oh dear. which of these is true about Bruce Springsteen? 
A. The first song he learned to play on guitar was Buddy Holly's Oh Boy. B. Bruce wrote Hungry Heart for Peggy Smith, but she was doing a concept album and it didn't fit. C. The working title for the Darkness on the Edge of Town album was Lost America. Or D. When he was a child, he smelled chocolate all the time because he lived near the Nestle factory. True or not true? Which of these um, is true? About I believe it's Hasty Heart and Patty. I believe it's Hasty Heart and Patty Smith. I believe. Is this true? Final is answer. True. I'm afraid your answer was a little hasty, uh, Leslie. Because first mm -hmm. of all, the song is Hungry Heart, and, and I meant well, remember, that's my also, theatrical background. Okay. No, 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 no. That is not actually true. I, I can tell you this before we get the skill opportunities. That Hungry Heart he wrote, believe it or not, for the Ramones. Oh. And and the Ramones would have loved it, but Bruce Springsteen's manager uh, wanted Springsteen to keep it for himself for because he sensed a hit. Guess what? He was right. So, yep. but we have a, a steal opportunity. Wow, this is your day, Leslie. It came up a six again, but of course. Okay, I Cooper, get a second chance. Wait a minute now. Not <laughs> the way it works, Doctor Sue. You know, but Melanie can because Melanie has a, a four as her number. So Melanie. You get a steal opportunity here. Which of these is not true about the boss, Bruce Springsteen? Is it, or oh, sorry, no, oh, sorry, forgive me. It forgive is me. true, right? It yes. Is true. Okay, we're looking forgive for me. truth. Forgive me, yes. Aren't we all? No. I, the one only one I remember is that he smelled chocolate, cause, probably because I'm hungry. So are you going with that one as being true? No, that's the only one I remember. I need the other two. The first song he learned to play on guitar was Buddy Holly's Oh Boy, or the working title for uh, the Darkness on the Edge of Town album was Lost America. Oh, but there's the, and the chocolate one. And, 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 and the chocolate one, there's, yeah, the one she remembered. I mean, it's whenever there's like a really weird and specific one, a part of me thinks from a trivia perspective that it's true, just so, but the Lost America thing, so that feels like it could be true. Tough. I like to be the last person to steal because then you're 50 50 yeah. but uh, i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with lost america for my answer is that your final answer give me don't let me answer that question and call it my final answer <laughs> well i'm afraid at least on this particular question all is lost for you mm. it's not mm. Correct. So, David, you get the 50-50 steal. Okay. Uh, Bruce Springsteen. I'm sure you saw the Broadway show. So, which of these was is the true? Huh? I don't know if the answer was in the show. Probably not. Okay. Well, they might mention. I don't know. All right. So, uh, the first song that Bruce Springsteen learned on guitar was Buddy Holly's "Oh Boy." Or, right. Or, or when he was a child, he smelled chocolate all the time because he lived near the Nestle factory. One so of those a, is true. So it's A or D, right? Correct. All right. Um, I think he grew up in New Jersey and Nestle, well, no, the Hershey factory is in, would be in Pennsylvania. So I don't know. So that, that, uh, I don't know what the Nestle factory was. So it's A or D? A. Is that uh, oh boy, Buddy Holly. Oh boy, oh boy, you're wrong. No. <laughs> So my instinct was right. The weirdest one is always the correct answer in trivia. Not all. Freehold, New Jersey. New Jersey, all New Jersey is, is one continuous smell going into another. Oh, so those factories that's true. Candy things. So yeah, he, he smelled, he was near the Nestle uh, factory. Um, I told you about Hungry Heart. Um, the first song he learned on guitar was the Beatles' Twist and Shout. Oh, um, so oh well. And Darkness on the Edge of Town, the working title was actually taken from a 1932 Frank Capra film called American Madness. Wow. The working title of that album. I stumped you all. Oh, I yeah. stumped the panel. You stumped the panel. You Thank you for that. <laughs> yep. Yes, as a matter of fact, to be fair, this is one of the first times this has happened. Joyce's help. <laughs> she, she basically came up with that question and wrote oh. the, the thing. So that was Joyce's question. Oh. Well, well done. done. Okay. I slay grad students. <laughs> <laughs> now we have, we're in the middle of our second round, which means that David Sheward gets to right now. Careful. David Sheward doesn't have any points yet, but he's a very dangerous competitor in this game. 
Let's see how you do on this question. It comes from his reptilian background. <clears throat> yeah, you're seeing his eye thing. That's right. Do, do the fake eyelid. There we go. <laughs> mm. It's a caruncular lacrimal caruncle. I think uh, yeah. As opposed to the lacrimal car, car ant. So. Uh, and an enforced carbuncle, which I must needs call mine. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh. Ah. Shakespearean yet. Now, now, Joyce, of course, came up with this one. Let me just yell, Lynn manuel Noriega. <laughs> yes, all the in-jokes are coming out now. Here's another question from Joyce, and it's a good one. Oh, no. No, no this is very meaningful to her. Okay, go ahead. A person like ever. Oh. 1925. Oh, yes. Born, He's a saint. Born this year, <laughs> on this day, on October 16th, 1925. Happy 96th birthday to Angela Lansbury. Oh, okay. yes. Wow. Alive and well, born today in London to English and Irish parents. Which of these is not true, David Seward, about Angela Lansbury? All right. A, her first film was Gaslight. Her second was National Velvet. B, she was a featured murderer in an episode of Columbo. C, on Murder, she wrote, Jessica Fletcher's middle name was Beatrice, in tribute to Lansbury's friendship with Beatrice Arthur. Or D, the part of Jessica Fletcher on Murder, She Wrote, was first offered to Gene Stapleton. Wait, which, is, uh, which of these I, is not true? I think it's that she was, it's, it is not true that she was on Columbo, because I don't remember her ever being on Columbo. I think that's not true. Is that your final answer? Yes. Well, just, just one more thing, sure, if I can just say that you are absolutely right. You must be yeah. like a Columbo, you're a Columbo completist, yes. apparently. Well, I just remember uh, th all the people that were on, and I don't remember her ever being, that would have been, oh, this is neat, she was a murderer. Oh, yeah, Angela Lanza, all right. Got yeah, it. Well, well, he he yeah. just remembers everything. If yeah. he's heard well, it. You have encyclopedic it. knowledge. Or read it, he knows. Maybe, he knows. yes, I'm gathering. I mean, I could guess all of the, the people who are murderers on Columbo, I, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I remember thought there was Johnny Cash, there was- Please uh, don't. I remember Please the Johnny Cash yeah, I'm not episode. going to. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so I'm not allowed to fill up time, like- <laughs> some, other <laughs> some other people. I'm not I allowed to go- I was waiting for a comeback. No, I knew that- I'm not allowed to go off on tangents. Absolutely, That's not allowed. you are absolutely allowed to do whatever David will let you do. Now, here's, here, here's a question for David, the, the encyclopedic movie knowledge person, and Leslie too, and maybe Melanie. Just yes. no points, no nothing. But um, uh, it is true that Lansbury's first film was Gaslight. Her second film was National Velvet. Do you remember what her third film was? Because she had them like right in a row. They were you know, big. Oh, uh, the one with Judy Garland about the Harvey oh, Girls. Is that the it? Harvey Girls. Nope. It was a picture of Dorian Gray. Oh. Oh, okay. right. For which okay. she got her second Oscar nomination. You agreed with me, David, over your own encyclopedic knowledge? Wow. I couldn't, I, you know, yeah. For which she won her uh, third, uh, second Oscar nomination. Right. So right. here's the deal. We have a great game. We've got Melanie in front with four points, Leslie with two points, David with two points. I love when this happens. And we're finishing the second round of our Today Yesterday quiz with a question that will now go directly. How did I do this again? I, the, the, this went to... <laughs> it goes to... Melanie. Me. It goes to David. It goes to, it goes to David, right? No, oh, David no. got the last one. I got Angela Lansbury. That wasn't a steal. Yes, but that was a steal, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Oh, I sorry. Excuse me. It sorry. Direct. I'll shut up now. Okay. I, I don't really. Do I get the, the clues in anew again? <laughs> well, no, no. Here's here. no. You have to Angela know. was telling me about it when I met her uh, at New York One. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. He said, I always forget. I used to be the critic on the York one. I never met that. Um, yeah. yeah, I was. And I, she was there to be interviewed, and we met in the dressing room briefly. And uh, she uh -huh. said, oh, I always regretted I was never on Columbo. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. As one leads with, usually. No, she yes, right. Say that. Say that. Was My she very nice? Said it'll be on her tombstone. <laughs> well, was, was she very nice? I, I, yeah, yeah, she was very nice. I, I said, we. I just watched the Harvey Girls the other night on TCM. It was so amazing to see you. And she talked about how they filmed, where they filmed it, that was like a, a, a ranch outside of Hollywood. And uh, Oh, yay. Oh, yeah. yay. All right, we have a question now for Melanie to to. to I'm, I'm ready for you. Sorry, babe. The year, 1938. Billy the Kid, Aaron Copeland's ballet, premieres at Chicago City Opera House. 
Mm. Which of these is true about Henry McCarty, a.k.a. the real Billy the Kid? A. Billy's first arrest was for disturbing the peace. B. Billy the Kid never robbed a bank. C. Billy escaped from prison by breaking one of his wrists to remove handcuffs. Or D. Both Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and Young Guns featured Chris Christopherson. Wait, is this the, um, is, which is true? Which is, which of these, only one of these is true. D. Both Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and Young Guns, those two movies featured Chris Christopherson. Is that your final answer? Yep. Oh, I'm afraid you got burned there, Melanie. You got James Cole burned. He was in both of those films. Oh, right. In Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Alongside, speaking of which, you and uh, Bob Dylan was in there too. Uh, very weird casting. With this holy water. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, uh. So here's the come to dice moment where we have a number five, which is between Melanie and Leslie. So Leslie, you get a steal opportunity here all about um, Billy the Kid. So do you want me to read them again? Yes, please, now, because I was I was looking for a pen, which I couldn't find. Now right. I'm good. <clears throat> Sorry. So which of these <laughs> is true about Henry McCarty, the, Billy the Kid? Billy's first arrest was for disturbing the peace. B, Billy the Kid never robbed a bank. Or C, Billy escaped from prison by breaking one of his wrists to remove handcuffs. Remove handcuffs by breaking wrist. The other two? Um, first arrest was for disturbing the peace. Are you okay? Leslie, you're right. Something fell in my in the other room. I don't know what it is, but I live alone, so it can't be alive. Finish the question and then yeah, yeah, yeah. more important, Leslie. Leslie. I know. So much more important than, than priorities. Priorities. Priorities, yes. Okay, go ahead. Or Billy the Kid never robbed a bank. Never robbed a bank, broke his wrist. Or his first arrest was for disturbing the peace. Thank you. Very sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I don't think he was a bank robber. I, I don't remember that being part of the... Well, he had to be a bank robber, but he killed people. If you kill people during a bank robbery. I know. I, I, keep, I, I keep heading toward the broken wrist thing. It just sounds so... But I don't think he was like... I'm going to say his first arrest was for disturbing the peace. That's true, you're saying. Yes. You're saying that is true. Is that your final answer? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I have some disturbing news for you, Leslie. It's not true. So we okay. have a single opportunity for the dangerous Dave, right? This is, is, is yours, right, David Stewart? Yes, yes, okay. So we have a 50-50 on this one. Which so is he never robbed a bank or... Oh. Um, he escaped from prison by breaking Break his wrists. Yeah. So it's either B or D, right? Right. Okay. I think it's, I think he robbed trains and not banks. Uh, because the, maybe they, the out west, the, the banks were not, did not have as much cash as a train would. I think he was a train robber, not a bank robber. So I'm going to say he never robbed a bank. It's true. Final answer? Yes. That was some good choo choo choosing on your part, David Sheward. Billy the Kid never robbed a bank. And, and so that was B? Um, B. It, David does this thing with letters, Melanie. I'm trying to see, like, to see how many have been used before. So, um, yes, it was Interesting. B. And you've totally broken the pattern because you've used B three times and D twice. So I know, a, because, because you to told him that's what you were doing, dummy. Yeah. No pattern. <clears throat> you did it deliberately. By the way, if I'm not mistaken, John Kreitza, the ballet, the great ballet ballet dancer, was the original Billy the Kid, and I think I had a crush on him when I was when I was a kid. Yeah. I oh. saw him on on Ed Sullivan or someplace like oh. that, and I just like, he was the handsomest man I'd ever seen. So it's it, and it is that he robbed trains and not banks. Well, he robbed, uh, but in fact, his first arrest was actually for stealing clothing with another oh. robber. So he, oh. he started really pretty small. Um, I mean, they, they robbed other things, obviously. And he, um, this is this is kind of amazing. Wasn't that Macklemore? Well, he escaped one time. He was on death. He was going. He got a death penalty. He escaped because he told the guards that he needed to use the outhouse. Oh. <laughs> he got to the outhouse. 
grabbed the other guy's gun, shot him to death, shot some other deputies to death, and ran, ran away. It was like a nice fella. Oh, uh, the, good, <laughs> the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the good old caves right here because we have a tie game. We have David Seward with four points, Melanie Greenberg with four points, Leslie Hovan Blake with two points, and we're going into round three of our Today Yesterday game here, live on this October 16th, excuse me, 2021, on Dave's Gone By, with me, Dave Lefkowitz, my darling and adorable wife, Joyce, and we're we're doing the Turning Green edition of the show in honor of our guest, Melanie Greenberg, who is in a tie for first place. This is exciting, but Leslie... You're only two points away from tying the other two, and this question goes to you. So this could happen. Because I love it when we have a three-way tie. Guess what, Leslie? You get three clues in the news. Oh, wow. Okay. Are you ready? Sure. Three words that are not connected to each other, but connected to another word. Tie. Cross. Ox. Him again slowly. Uh, yeah. Uh, tie, cross, ox. I have absolutely no idea. Tie, cross, ox. Tie, cross. Uh oh. David's shaking his head like. Ox, cross, cross. Ox cross tie. Let me try saying it backwards. Maybe I'll get it that way. Ox. He's doing my neck. Cross ox uh -huh. tie. I can't even come up with a word that goes with what. Well, I'll say break. I'll say break. Tie tie tiebreaker. I don't know. Oh, right. no, yeah, I have no idea. Well. I think I, I have it. just got it. Here, <laughs> <Leslie>. Yes. <laughs> no. No. Break is not the correct word, I'm afraid, Leslie. It was a good guess. It's it was a very good guess, guess. yes. Okay. It was. I, it, this is no. a tough one, Leslie. It took me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's like you're, yeah. It's like it's like all or none. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the New York Times B game, where mm -hmm. you think you know get the word either, or it's just like never. So something just happened to my screen. Something came up here. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, it's a vaccine. It's a vaccine update for some reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good to know. There you go. Okay. Anyway, we just came up with a number five okay. on the roll. So number five is closest to well, Leslie, but also Melanie. So Melanie, you got to steal. I just had that aha moment where it just clicked in. It's Bo. Uh -huh. Is that your final answer? It is. And what made you think of that word? I don't know how this works. It just, oh, yeah. I, I think it was, you know, I, I think that it was, it was, uh, it was a uh, cross that I thought like uh, that came to me first. It's like you get one yeah. of them and they all click in. Right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Because exactly. you know, crossbow, bow tie, yes. oxbow incident. Right. And of course, why was why is bow in the news? Mm, it's sad. It's very sad. Somebody died named Bo. Oh no! It's oh no! Worse. You guys didn't. No. Well, a, a, te a terrorist in Nor Norway, oh, Norway, Norway killed like five people with a bow and arrow. Oh, I oh, did my hear God. that. No, I did hear that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. if you take That's the guns sad. away, the violence doesn't stop. That's what the NRA. Yeah. Is. In Norway. Can't wait for that. Well, I I firmly believe in in archery control. In uh, <laughs> I really yeah, do. the the, <laughs> the BRA. I mean, because think about it. in England, what two days ago they had some big politician that was stabbed to death. Yeah. Stabbed yeah. to death, but that, exactly that's what I was thinking at the time. I almost did a spit take on my computer. Thank you very much, Dave. I. <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome. There you go. Anyway, check this out, Melanie. Our newbie, our guest, is winning the game so far, yeah. six to four to two. So, it, you know, this is this is going your way, your way, Melanie, but we're still in the third round. Stuff can still happen because David Sheward gets the next question. Okay. And he's only two points away from you. David, are you ready? Right. The year was 1950. Released today in England 
a story for children called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. According to factretriever.com, which of these is not true about lions? A, when a lion purrs, it signals to other lions that no, preg that, sorry, that no predators are nearby. Uh, B, lions can breed with leopards and make leopards. C, several years ago at a nature preserve, a lion adopted a baby antelope. She raised it for two weeks but lost it when she fell asleep and another lion ate it. <laughs> Oh, that's awful. <laughs> or, or, you know, she, the darker the mane, the sexier the lion to a female lion. Hmm. That's it? Those are, those are all four? Yeah, those are all yeah, four. Isn't that enough? You were saying it, the way you were saying it, like, your, voice, <laughs> your yeah. voice kind of went up as if there was more to come. No, there's, there's no more than that. All right, yeah. Those all sound very plausible, so let's see. Um, <laughs> those all sound very plausible. Well, I, all four, you know, only one is not. True. It's not true. Okay. I think the darker the mane, the sexier the lion is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, okay, so one lion, that the story with the adopted antelope, that just sounds so crazy. It sounds like you made it up. But the first, so what are the other two? Um, when a lion purrs, it signals to other lions that no predators are nearby. Right. Okay. Lions can breed with leopards and make weapons. Now, Several okay. years ago, a nature preserve... Uh, lion adopting an antelope, but didn't go well. Or D. I think the thing with the. I'm sorry. But D, the, the, the darker the the darker the mane, the, the sexier the lion. Am I it's not true. And which is not true. Okay. Um, you can hear me. No, no. Wait. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. All right. I haven't made my choice yet. I was just going over them. Oh, sorry. Um, I think the the thing with the leopards and the lions breeding that sounds like it's not true, but I think it's actually possible because, it, and, and maybe it happened once and, and they were driven out of town and they had to go to another state. And then and it's only to, illegal in Arkansas. And they went, yeah, and they went to the Supreme Court. <laughs> they went to the Supreme Court and, or, or they had a sitcom called Lions and Leopards. David, no more, no more. Somebody's going to steal your idea and make a movie. Okay. Shut okay. Right, yeah. No, 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 this is part of the process. He's got to do it. Yeah. Uh, and I can relate. I think, <laughs> so the other one was, uh, 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 I went off in my, my, my pitch meeting already. I was envisioning it. But what's the third one? <laughs> Wait a Third one was like a nature preserve, a lion adopted a baby oh. antelope. You know, she raised it for two weeks, but lost it when she fell asleep and another lion ate it. I think you made that up. I'm going to go with the antelope. Okay. Is that your final answer? Yes. Well, sorry, Dave, I wasn't lying about that one. That actually happened. Oh. <laughs> it was a tragic little wow. tale. I was crazy enough that you would make that sounded crazy, but okay. Thanks for, for knowing that I would do something crazy. Let's roll the die. Comes up numero cuatro, which is Melanie's number. Melanie, you can... You can um, I'm going to say the one about the purring is not true. Is not true. Is that your final answer? Sure is. I gotta tell you, Melanie, the answer was perfect. You got it right. How did you, what made you think? What made you know? I was like, that seemed, that sounds the least for Cocta. So it's probably the <laughs> fake one. <laughs> so, oh, she's you know, using the for Cocta method. I didn't know I'm that. I'm using the for Cocta method. I'm realizing like all factor. the for Cocta factor. When something's yeah. like for Cocta, it like impl so implausible, it's probably true. Well, here's the- Otherwise it would be a terrible, you know, yeah. fake answer. But here's, here's the, the, the funny part that, that never have occurred to me. Lions can't purr. Who knew? Oh, interesting. Oh. Little cats can, like uh, ocelots and lynxes can purr, but mm -hmm. just lions, things like, they, they can't purr. They can't lions do it. Really? Yeah. And lions only run in a straight line. That's another interesting thing I found. Out. They can go zoop, and then they have to stop and kind of pivot because they're so huge that they, they never, they can't. They can't you know. swerve. Oh, wow. That's helpful information. Well, if you're ever attacked, yes, by him, yeah. right. <laughs> Just run to the side, and they'll never get you. <laughs> or you know, <laughs> zoom the star going across the screen. For your next safari, very good information. Yes. 
<laughs> Unless I'm greatly mistaken, and I've been, very often been greatly mistaken. No, you're not. Just, you know, just, just no matter what happens, it's sort of a Magamogio moment, a Ken Jennings moment. This is one of the, maybe only the second time in history that a new person has won the Today, Yesterday quiz. Because we've got one more question in round three, but we've got an eight to four to two game. Whoa. So I don't think anything can occur at this point. No, but we're going to ask the questions. I can, I can die now having accomplished something no, great. Yeah. 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 If you want to really be champion, if you want to be the real king of the world here, or queen of the world, or, or, or whatever, you know, I can't even think of something now. I've been talking for three and a half hours. Melanie, you can get 10 points if you get your final question right, because this is still your question to end oh. the third round. The year was 1960. Oh, so it seems like it's mine to lose. No, you no, you're just gonna win. Yeah. you win. You'll win. Also, yeah, yeah. Oh, so they no can't get 10 points. No, yeah, I, no only way. I can get 10 points. Okay. I was like, what yeah. is this? It's a sham. <laughs> no, <laughs> Give me the it's crown and then they so will set you up and, and then you take you it win. away. You right? win no matter what. Okay. <laughs> so it's for, it's for two more points that would give you 10. which would be Okay, open. understood. Okay, got it. Got it. I like those. Here we go. 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis begins as JFK squares off against Khrushchev and Castro. Let's test your Cuban. Here are four definitions of Cuban words and slang terms, one of which is incorrect. Okay. Incorrect, okay. Can we say this again? So here's, here's some Cuban-y, Spanish-y words. Okay. And their definitions. Okay. All of these are correct diga, except diga. one. So, <laughs> so, so digame, here we go. Digame, yes. A, digame mucho. chancletas are flip-flop shoes. Okay. B, La Yuma is the mother-in-law. C, Guagua is a bus. Or D, Acere is a friend. Wow, that's tough. That is tough. Um, tough. I'm going to go with D. You're going to say that that is not true, that Acere is not a friend or there's no word such as Acere. Is that your final answer? It is my final answer, Acere. Well, I'm seriously telling you that is not correct. So we have a steal opportunity here uh, just for the fun of it. It goes to number six, Leslie. Leslie, do you want to try stealing this Cuban? Yes, please. May I have the, the, the words again, please? Chancletas are flip-flop shoes. La Yuma is the mother-in-law. Or Guagua is a bus. And you want the one that isn't true. There is not an actual definition. I know for sure one of them, which I won't say out loud. So it's only the other two I have to deal with. I'm going to say chongletas is the word for flip flop. It's not true. It's not true. It's okay. not true. Well, Leslie, you flip, but you flopped. Yeah. Chongletas are indeed flip flops. So, the mm. is that there's a joke, right? Among moms who define self defined as Mexican. The La Changla, they throw the flip-flop at the kid. That's really? a joke. Oh. Yeah, that's a joke. Mm. That's like, so, David, I think you get a steal opportunity here. Okay, so my choices are Guagua or what? Guagua is a bus or La Yuma is the mother-in-law. Uh, I'll say Guagua. Is that your final answer? Yes. Well, your bus was a bust. I'm afraid <laughs> I stumped everybody on the panel. Bus. This was the only one I knew for sure was real. I didn't know oh. the other ones. Yuma is actually a slang, what they call the America, uh, the USA, yeah, yeah. is La Yuma. No, oh, I, really? I don't, that wasn't part of the whole. Wait, you know, wait. So Yuma is the one that is fake. Right. Yuma oh. does not mean mother in law. Yuma oh. means if you're from La Yuma, it means you're from America. You're from the United States. Oh, yeah. Okay. La suegra is uh, mother in law. I don't know if that's how Cubans say it. Don't know. Don't know. So here's the deal. First of all, speaking of Cuba, let's give Melanie a cigar as we go into our unnecessary tiebreaker because Melanie has won anyway. Mazel tov. For, but, I thought this is, that's the, the, that's excellent. It's the position from which I like to be entering yes, into right. the tiebreaker, <laughs> having already won. There you go. You've already won. So get your pens and papers right. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Oh. oh. 
I hope you wear that mask at the theater day <laughs> when they, they require that your mask. Oh, that's that would pretty. be great. That's yeah. so pretty. So here's the deal. This is how this works, Melanie. You wouldn't know this because you didn't stay and watch a whole fucking round. But she still won. <laughs> I watched enough to win, Dave. Yay. <laughs> that's all it takes. So here's, here's how we do it. I read one more question. Everybody writes down his or her answer. And then I'll read the question again. I'll count down three, two, one. And then you lift up your answer to the camera. So this way everybody can answer the question at the same time. So, no, no verbal, right? No, no verbal. Yeah. So okay. are you guys ready? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 1972 was the year. Following a long period of dissension, this rock band breaks up, but not before releasing such albums as Green River, Cosmos Factory, and Pendulum. Name that group. Say it again. Following a long period of dissension, on this date in 1972, this rock band breaks up, but not before releasing such albums as Green River, Cosmos Factory, and Pendulum. Name that group. Okay. Mm. Do your xylophone. You're waiting oh. music. Yes, that's it. I'm afraid I might start playing one of their, their tunes. Hold on. No, play something different. Oh. Play a little Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> the scotch tape makes it better. Anything in a cartoon for David, you know. So, Melanie, are you, do you have an answer? Have you written anything? I mean, I, it's not the right answer, but, you know, just so as to have something written down. Yes. Website, yeah, you. you can also one one of the things that people do is if they not they don't know an answer at all, you can just put down uh, the elephant in the room dot com, <laughs> <laughs> or is it in the room dot com or elephant in the room dot com? It's like, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room dot com mm -hmm. for your show. But I'm going to read the question again, and then you're all going to hold up whatever you wrote on a three two okay. one note. On this date in 1972, following a long period of dissension. This rock band breaks up, but not before releasing such albums as Green River, Cosmos Factory, and Pendulum. Name that group. Three, two, one. Josie and the Pussycats, CSNY, and I can't see yours. What did you write down, Melanie? I wrote Cream. Great. Really, really great answers from all. Well, maybe not Josie and the Pussycats is not, but mm. the, the, the funniest answer. The answer is if I say, um, Born on the bayou. Creedence Clearwater. Oh, CCR? CCR, Creedence Clearwater. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The, the Cosmos Factory is a pretty well-known album, Green River. And oh, yeah. Now, I mean, now that you say it, it was... was right. you know. I, I recognize the Cosmos name, but I couldn't put it to a band. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't right. Matter. Melanie won the game. Yeah. I won the game. I'm so bad at shameless self-promotion that I actually have my website wrong um, it's the elephant in the room show.com oh, okay. i know i know um so wait, wait, the elephant in the room was taken yeah i know <laughs> probably it's real, it's, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly it's on our thing the elephant yeah. in the room show jesus christ show.com i know well i just you did, you know, i come here i do the quiz and then i give everyone the wrong website I, you know not easy to find because you're not on facebook as we know it's kind of hard to find you i know i've just i'm just starting to learn how to use the internet i finally have a website which is melaniegreenberg.com Melanie that wasn't taken miraculously. Yeah. Um, and the <laughs> elephant in the room show.com. So yeah, well, I'm coming coming into the, the, the new century. Yes. What is that? Searching. What is that picture behind? Yeah. Sorry, Lizzie. You know, yeah. yeah. This is this it a like I've been looking at it the whole time. It's actually so I'm this isn't my house. I'm my house under oh. construction. This is a rental house. It's bought it says Botticelli. Oh, oh okay. I I I I it's really hard to recognize with, you know, the, anyway. Okay, thank you. The one time I bought a chubby, it was very expensive. I was way off. Yeah, there's a little five uh, chubby joke uh, right there. Ah, ah. Uh, so we're reminding people seriously that go see the Elephant in the Room 
which is a show, at the United Solo Festival. It's going to be on, first of all, on the 29th. There are more tickets made available, even though it was sold out, on the 29th of October and then November 6th and 7th on Theater Row. You said it's at the Studio Theater in the Theater Row building on, uh, was it 410 West 40? Correct. Right. So and you can get there through the United Solo website. You can buy the tickets. If you're a Broadway fan, it is like one big love letter to Broadway. I mean, basically as a kid who has spent my, it's basically the retelling of my story through the lens of a kid who loved Broadway musicals with my own pastiche version of, you know, songs from Broadway musicals that sort of helped me survive the various episodes of my life. Wait, is oh. there music in it? Is, 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 I, I thought... Oh yes, it's, 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 uh, it's, I'm really bad at shameless self-promoting. I've been here for three hours and, and you still don't know <laughs> that there's music in it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a musical. I, you know, it's basically every event of my life is seen through the lens of a kid who loves show tunes. So I'm in the psych ward and Coast my West? doctor is uh, Miss Hannigan from Annie. <laughs> written you, little girls West to Coast? be about, you know. Were you a was, West Coast kid or an East Coast kid? West Coast. West Coast moved here when I was 12 to wow. New York. So, so it was from afar. You loved all the Broadway shows from Well, afar, yeah, so I we saw, it. you know, we got the touring casts in LA. So... Yeah. I saw them all in, in Charles you know, Leslie whatever. Riley and Lear. And then, <laughs> right? That's just a yeah. big banana. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, speaking of the usual top banana in our quiz, we've got David Sheward, who did not win today. But David Sheward is always a winner because he's a fine writer, and you can Thank read you. him um, in culturaldaily.com, theaterlife.com. What, I know the shows that you said you've been yeah. you've gone to see, but what have you reviewed this past uh, this week, I have a review of Thoughts of a Colored Man and Chicken and Biscuits. Ooh. How uh, are you? Yeah, should I see either of those, David? I, I've been remiss. Uh, Thoughts of a Colored Man is very good. Oh. Uh, it's like it's a male version of For Colored Girls uh, with seven characters sort of in poetic terms discussing what it means to be African-American and male in today's world. And they each represent a different aspect of that. But it, it, it's very good. I, I really liked it. I'm surprised it took to somebody so long to come up with that idea. It's a yeah. brilliant idea. Yeah. And uh, Chicken and Biscuits is a very, very broad comedy. It's a, it's a sitcom. And, you know, if you, if you like, I thought it was a bit much. It had its laughs, but it was way over the top. I mean, I mean, if I say the word, when I, the first time I heard about it and I started reading the reviews, I'm like, Chitlin Circuit. Is that kind of kind like of, Wilson was flagging against? Or Tyler that? Perry. Ta it's yeah. Kind of, kind of, it's very broad. It's very comic. There's some very good performances in it. Uh, yeah. Norm Lewis is very good. Oh, wow. Uh, He's Norm Lewis, yes. All right. uh, uh, there's a young actress named Anne, Ang, Agner Mizell who plays a sort of a bratty teenager who is very, very good. She's very funny. Isn't uh, that how uh, John Travolta mispronounced Dina Menzel's name? <laughs> well, I, and I probably mispronounced her name. It's, it's, it's a very strange <laughs> name. Now, the other question I want to ask David Sheward is, you also have a blog called The David Desk. Mm -hmm. uh, did you write about anything for the blog this week? Uh, now I've been kind of busy, uh, but I still have up my latest reconstruction of the Carol Burnett show, in which I talk about the episode with her and Wayne Rogers and Buddy Epson, where they do War is Heck right. and uh, West, West Dakota County Fair, uh, the, the, these satires of uh, movies that she did all the time. And, I'm, and there's also one with Steve Lawrence and Sally Struthers called The Boring Twenties, which is... Uh, Two very funny episodes. Oh, good. Oh, good. So everybody read David Sheward in these various places. The David Desk for his blog, uh, where he's doing the Carol Burnett reprise stuff, and, and also culturaldaily.com, theaterlife.com for the theater. And I have to get to a matinee, so I'm going to yeah, say- we're, we're, bye. <laughs> bye. It was lovely to meet you, Melanie, and congratulations. It was so nice to meet you, David. Yeah. I'll look forward to reading your work. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, and, and good luck with the elephant. Thank you. Bye, Leslie. Bye. Goodbye, David. David. And I have to pick my daughter up at nature camp, which is something you only say when you live in the Berkshires. It's also on our show this week. Um, so our, our YouTube interview that you did. Oh, sorry. David is also on a camera with our uh, with, with his co-hosting with Charlie for um, what the hell did they see? I don't remember. David told you at the top of the show what they saw together. I don't remember. I don't recall. Either, but everybody go to Critics Circle, the YouTube channel, to see Leslie mm -hmm. Hope and Blake. Everybody go For see sure. Elephant in the Room. And the, the website is the Elephant in the Room Show. 
Melanie.com and also MelanieGreenberg.com. Welcome. Please come back and play another. Uh, lovely to have you. Yeah. Oh, it was so lovely to be here and lovely to meet you, Leslie and Dave. And you win. You won for gosh. And sake. I won. Bragging rights for at least the next five minutes. And then I'll, you can, you. I'll take all the bragging rights I can get for as long as I can get them. Big kisses to the audience, everybody. I gotta let you go Zoom wise. So farewell. Have a great, great week. Just sing from uh, Bon Jovi. Bye -bye. Goodbye.